All right, here we are again on another Shabbat. I think it's the second month of the Hebrew calendar, the lunar solar Hebrew calendar as that is. And we're at the last day, which is the Shabbat, the fourth Shabbat. Let's see, we had the 8th, 15th, 22nd, today is the 29th day of the month. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're within a few days here, for those that do Pentecost, uh, which means 50, 50 costs or something, whatever it is, it's Greek. For those that celebrate it, that's 50, it's the 50th day from Passover. We'll have that coming up here real soon. That's, that's a confusing celebration, I'm telling you. The church got a lot of things. Christianity got, a, let me say it like that. Christianity has a lot of things confused up because uh, when you look at it, if you count 50 days from uh, Passover, it would have to be exactly 50, all right? But, but what are they doing? Are they doing 50 days from Passover? Or are they doing seven Sabbaths, seven Sabbaths and adding, adding one day? Seven Sabbaths and add one day, and that makes 50. Because if you add seven Sabbaths and add one day, that's more than 50 days from Passover. All right? Uh, so, but we know that it's gonna be somewhere in July. All right? That the, that the celebration is called the Feast of uh, Wheat Harvest. Uh, I think it's called, what is it, Shavuot? Feast of Wheat Harvest? And uh, it's a harvest, it's a wheat harvest, all right? You won't get no wheat anytime soon right now in, in, in May, okay? You won't get no wine, no, none of that right now. In May. You might have some little small grapes, no itty bitty grapes, but uh, right now you won't really get to harvest. So I think Christians should go back and really rethink that thing uh, last week we spoke about uh, the the uh, the holy day, the day uh, Sabbath day, which is the fourth commandment, and the on the ten commandments, the fourth, which has something to do with Yahweh. So you know the the first four is commandments directly dealing with Yahweh Allah, and uh, the the last six is dealing with your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself. Okay, and. Uh, so we spoke about uh, the Sabbath day, which today is the Sabbath, and how important it is and how uh, this is gonna be come down to really uh, uh, come to the head in the latter days, that it's gonna have something to do with the mark, the mark of the beast, you know, because it is the sign, the Sabbath is a sign between Yahweh and his people. That word sign means mark. So what do you think the mark of the beast is in, the, in the Revelation chapter 13? It has something to do with a mark, but just like that Sabbath day is a mark for God's people between him and God, between them and God, okay? So it's really something else right there. So uh, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the honor of kings to search it out. And he said he would hide his Sabbath, Sabbath from us because of our sins, and he did. But that doesn't mean it can, it can be found out. It can be. I believe that many people are searching it out and it's been found out, you know? But uh, we'll get more into that in a little bit here. First of all, I wanna get into, uh, into uh, saying all the praise to Yahweh, first of all. You know, all praises be to Yahweh. Allah, I am our God of the football gods. The son, Yahweh Shai Hamashiach. Redemption and restoration to the God the Father. Right? All right, let's see. Uh, hold on just a moment. We're going to get on a topic, a grand topic here. I'm going to start off, first of all, with a, a topic that my nephew wanted me to talk on about Psalm 45. 
45. A lot to do with it. It's a mystery. Psalm 45 is talking about. You know, it's a mystery. Uh, but I found it to be talking about really Yahweh himself, the God that sits on the throne. All right. I found it to be talking about that. And I, and I believe that everybody else, when it's all said and done, when it's fulfilled in the kingdom, everybody's going to know what this is talking about. And some people have searched it out and found it. It's the honor of kings to search out. I search out of my matter, right? Glory to God to conceal it. And it's the honor of kings to search it out. And uh, I think the more mysteries we search out and we understand about God, it's going to help us in the end. It's going to help us when it's all said and done. All right. Uh, you know how to read a map very well. You know your sense of directions. When you're needing to get to one place to another, from one place to another, you're in a very serious emergency like the end of the world or whatever, and you got a map on you and you're traveling, it's very good to have somebody or some, some people that know direction and know maps, that know how to get there and how, how to, to navigate quickly as possible through your, in your directions. All right, same way here in the word. When you're searching out the word, you wanna search out first before your hour starts coming. Let me, let me get that straight. Before Yahweh starts coming, you want to already be familiar with his word, definitely about his mysteries and about the truths. In other words, you want to work out all the kinks, all right? I've seen some very great Bible scholars. Uh, I can tell they were working out kinks and I would, uh, I would, I would uh, encourage everybody especially for great Bible scholars that are already knowledgeable and growing in the word and precept upon, upon precept and everything. Everybody, whether you're great or small, to search it out as much as you can. This is gonna pay you in the end. It's gonna, it's gonna have dividends, all right? But uh, this Psalm is talking, it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, is forever, all right? And we know Yahweh's throne is forever. He's the only one that sits on the throne in the heavens. And uh, we know that when Yahweh said taught us to pray, our father who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we, we read over that real quick, but listen to it. On earth, <clears throat> that means his kingdom's coming to earth. And his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's what we're really waiting on, his kingdom to come. And this is a, a psalm by the sons of Korah. Remember Korah in the wilderness, they, he didn't do too well. But his sons, they did not follow his footsteps. All right? Korah's sons didn't follow his footsteps. As a matter of fact, they became great worshipers and servants in the temple of Yahweh. All right? So his genealogy really was good. But he as a person did wrong in the wilderness and, and suffered for it. Uh, it says to the chief musician upon Shashanim, for the sons of Korah, miskil, miskil, maskil, a song of loves, all right, a song of loves. We're gonna go into this for a second or two and get a nice little taste of it real quick. And uh, there are some very great uh, jewels. And I was, in our study about Yahweh coming down here as the king of the kingdom, all right? Like I say always, I hear a lot of brothers and sisters talking about Yahweh is coming back and he's gonna be the king of the kingdom. But one thing they don't say, they don't say Yahweh is coming. And he's the king of the kingdom. I never hear people saying that, all right? And if they say that the king of the kingdom is Yahweh, they're saying that Yahweh Shai or Jesus is Yahweh. Now, like I said, I got a visit from Yahweh Shai uh, a year ago, and I was sitting around trying to trying to muse and thinking about how he is Yahweh, how the Son of Man or Yahweh Shai is Yahweh. He he come down in my presence and let, let me hear his voice. He said, "I'm not I'm not God." 
So I'm not, I'm not him. And right when he said that, he opened up my mind to see it and understand it. So then I was like, if he's not God, there's some confusing things in the word. That basically, it seemed like he is God. But if he's not God, which that does make sense because he did say, there's none good but God. When, he, when the rich young ruler and the man come up to him and call him good master. He basically was telling the man, I'm not God. But there's none good but God. All right. And uh, there's some other places in the scripture that tells you that he's not God. If God is praying in John chapter 17, if he is God, he's praying to somebody higher than him. All right. Now, that that's not showing that he is not God. Because I, I'm going to be honest with you. I believe that when the Father comes, the Father's coming is, uh, is mysterious. All right. And I'm going to show it to you in, in this Bible study. It's mysterious because it's even mysterious to him. <clears throat> because by him becoming a human being, he puts himself in a position to have faith. So who, who is he on, who is he gonna have faith in? He has to have faith in God or the person that is really himself. But he's gonna come down here not walking by sight. If he walked by sight, he would know everything and see everything. But he's coming down here to have a walk of faith too, to overcome the world. All right, and, uh, it, it's kind of obvious that Yahweh Shai knew what was going on. I mean, he was a baby and all of that. He was like, he was born into this world for that purpose. But the person in, in Isaiah 49, that basically doesn't give his name, but God knew him, called his name from the womb, is obviously the person that sits on the throne. All right, if we study that really good, if he's the one that sits on the throne and uh, what we have here is we have Yahweh that's in heaven and Yah is bringing us, he's setting up a kingdom on earth right, in these latter days. And he's, when we look at Yahweh Shai as the lamb, Yahweh Shai is the lamb of this person that's coming. He's the lamb of God, all right? He's the lamb of the person that's coming, the, the person that sits on the throne, the ancient of days. And you might say, why, why does the ancient of the days have a lamb, all right? He's the lamb of the ancient of days. And that's what Abraham figured out when he told his son, when his son asked him, I see the fire, I see the wood, but where's the, the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham told him, he said, son, my son, Yahweh will, will, will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So that means Yahweh's gonna provide, check this out, he's gonna provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So that means Yahweh will come down here and be amongst his people and will meet a lamb for a burnt offering. Okay, and we sometimes look over that and we don't see that, but it's letting you know that Abraham understood it and that while Yah was telling, was, was trying Abraham, he was also preaching to him the gospel of, of the lamb, of Yahawashai. That Yahawashai was that lamb as John the Baptist proclaimed. And when he saw him walk into his baptism, behold the lamb of God, I take away the sins of the world. All right, behold the lamb. I think that's what it says. That takes takes up away the sins of the world. And when he came up out of the water, there was a great voice that said, "This is my beloved son." After the Holy Ghost had descended upon him, he said, "This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased." All right. But there's some there's some mysteries. We're gonna go through this. We want to read this. We want to go through this reading real quick of Psalm 45. It says, "My heart is indicting a good matter." I speak of things which I have made touching the king. All right, so, so somebody's, and this is a, it's, somebody's talking about a king here, as you can see. And the only king that we can imagine is talking about right here, what it says, your throne or God is forever. This, this king is the one that sits on the throne in heaven. Now, here, let me explain it like this to those that don't understand this God of Israel. The God of Israel, Yahweh, is almighty, he can be in more than one place at the, at the same time. He's uh, omnipotent, omniscient, that's what that word means. In all places at the same time if he wants to be omniscient, all right? All right. But uh, he said, I speak of things which I've made touching the king. So this king can be on earth and in heaven at the same time, all right? Uh, let me highlight that. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. 
thou art fairer than the children of men. So this right here, and it says thou art fair. Let's look at the word fair, Hebrew 3302. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Let's go there real fast. Hold on just a moment. Primitive root, the word is Jaffa. Primitive root, probably to be bright. That is by implication, beautiful. Be beautiful to make self fair that can be. That, that's a key right there, to make self. So if he comes down, he's been made himself beautiful, or he's gonna make himself beautiful, all right? Make himself fair. I got it in parentheses here. Be made self, all right? We go get a haircut or we go do some, some weight lifting, build up our body, get in good shape. Sometimes that can make a person look very attractive or something, you know. But anyway, to be bright, that is by implication beautiful, be beautiful, be make self fair to deck. That means to deck themselves out. That means, you know, you can wear clothes where you can deck yourself out. And kings often did that in ancient times. All right. But this king, this person right here is fairer than the children of men. All right. Children of men. That word men is Adam. Let's, let me go there real quick. 120 Hebrew 120. Let's see. Adam, yeah, ready? That is a human being, an individual, or the species of mankind. Right, Adam, you are, you, are you are fairer than the children of Adam. Grace is poured into thy lips, therefore God has blessed thee forever. All right? Grace is poured into thy lips. Now, I want to say this. The, the experiences I've seen with Yahweh Shai, and I, I got, like I said, I got filled with the Holy Spirit in 1984. And I, from that time on, I've had supernatural events take place. I saw visions and, uh, and things that Yah has been trying to tell me. When I got filled with the Spirit, I saw some things. And I saw someone particularly. He was not sitting on a throne. But he was wearing with Orthodox Hebrew, Orthodox Jewish, Orthodox clothes. But he was a black man. He wasn't 33 years old. He was in his 50s. All right. And uh, there were some things I saw. And uh, there were some visions I saw. One of the visions, I, Yahweh Shai met me out in the street, you know, and he had on black clothes. He had a black t shirt on, kind of like a t shirt like I got on right now, but it was all black. Black pants, kind of similar. The man that was standing in the door when I when I got filled with the Holy Spirit was wearing black. Those clothes that the Jews wear over there, but this black a black coat, uh, suit coat, and slacks, and, and hard shoes. Well, Yahweh Shai that I met in the street in this vision was wearing a black shirt and black pants. I didn't look at the shoes, but he, you know, didn't have to. What really captured my attention about him was that he was an exact duplicate of me. He looked exactly like me, except he was a um, perfect image of my own self, all right? And he smiled at me. And, and when I saw this vision, I was, oh, how old was I, about 22, 23? He smiled at me and then he, said, he basically beckoned me and said, come on, let's go. So he took me to his house. Where he lived at, he lived in a he lived in an area where there was a, it was like a his whole vision was like a a gangster type setting, okay. So he's taking me to his house, and around his house, around other there was other gangs that was around the place, and I could feel it, I could sense it. All right, and uh, and then I've I've come to really see these other gangs that I sense as being some spiritual, spiritual enemies, all right? But this, this person in their house was the most powerful around. There was none powerful than them. So when, as I was going in the house, there was none of them showing up to say, hey, what you doing? Because they, the ones that I was with, which the son I had just met, he was taking me into the house to meet his father, okay? And he, like I said, again, he looked at the, the exact image of my own self. And he brought me into the house 
to meet his father. And he sat beside his father. His father was looking like, like as if he was sitting on the couch watching TV. But when I sat across from them, it's like I was sitting in the place where the TV was at. All right? So a lot of these things that, that are in these visions, they have meaning. Just like the word of God has deep meanings if you search it, go deep with it, you know. And he's like watching TV, but really I sat right where the TV was at. And uh, his, his father, he looked at his father and his father looked at him with a smile, all right? And, uh, and he, he left, the, the son left, took off and left after he looked at him with a smile and all that. He sat next to his father really humbly, you know what I'm saying? Not like, you know, hey, I'm your son, let me sit, take a seat here. No, he sat humbly, you know, like he's walking on eggshells and sat down very gently and carefully. And the father, I, I imagine, was God, all right? It was Yahweh. And uh, the father kind of looked like my father a little bit. It's really something that like my natural father. And uh, so as, as, as he took off and left, I didn't see where he went. But the father took me and he started saying, let me, let me take you through the house. All these things that were my sons, I'm giving it unto you. That's what he said. All these things that were my son, I'm giving it unto you. And then he told me, I'm not going to tell you who your seamstress is. And a lot of these things I'm still trying to search out because I know they're coming to pass, you know. But he said, I'm not going to tell you who your seamstress is. I went to the back of the house. They, they had many cars, just like you would think somebody that's very rich would have many cars. Yeah. Uh, the cars were setting. There was, there was many cars back there. And most of them looked like they was ancient uh, cars that was from the old times, 50s, 60s, 40s. You know what I'm saying? And I asked the guy that was back there watching him if I could grab one of the cars and take it for a test drive. He looked at me like I was crazy. He said, sure, what you asking me for? You know, and I'm thinking to myself, well, no, these are not my cars, but I had to remember in the vision. He said, all things that were my sons, I'm giving it unto you, all right? I took off in one of the cars and had a good time out there and I, and I still didn't, didn't take that serious at all things that was my son, I'm giving it unto you. And I recognized I, that I was gone too long. And I, I, instead of going back, because I knew I was in trouble, I thought I was in trouble. I parked and slept in the car, all right? And when I woke up in the morning, it was, the sun was shining and everything, and I was wondering what to do. I woke up after that. So, but the reason why I'm telling you all of this is because this reminds me of that vision. All right, the vision that I had, that um, that the son of man that Yahweh Shai was and is, um, he was the lamb of somebody. So somebody's coming into the world that gonna look, let me put it this way. Remember how in the vision, Yahweh Shai looked the, the exact split image of myself and said he was more perfect. Crisp, clean, perfect, exact, everything, all right? Uh, so what that looks like, that reminds me of, that looks like the lamb, that lamb that every part of the lamb in order to be sacrificed had to be perfect. That means without spot or blemish, all right? So Yahweh Shai was the lamb of somebody, all right? And this is how we find out whether this, this God that we're worshiping is really Yahweh Shai or not, all right? See, he's the lamb, he's the perfect sacrifice. For somebody who is he who is the lamb of he's the lamb of God. So that means that the God that shows up has to be showing up in the latter days. All right. The God is going to be coming down in the latter days. And we're not looking exactly for Yahweh Shai, but Yahweh Shai is coming with this God that's going to show up. It's called the day of Yahweh. It's not the return of Yahweh because he's never really come down like this. All right, we saw him come down on Mount Sinai with Moses and the children of Israel, but he didn't come down to stay. All right, he didn't come down this time, he coming to stay with his people. So he, this Yahweh Shai, which is the, basically the one that Yah created in the beginning of creation and helping where he used to create everything else, is the Lamb of God. This God is coming, he's the Lamb. And you might say, well, wouldn't that God that's coming be perfect? And I had to basically have a lamb to sacrifice for his sin. Um, I think we can go back to Genesis on that. 
where in Genesis chapter three, when after the man has sinned, all right? He said, the man, the, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. So when you look at that and you take that series and you study it, you break that down, one of those in heaven, one person in heaven would know good and evil, all right? But I think that the son, the one that stood in the place of the son, the one that was the sacrifice, the lamb, would have to be perfect. So we, will, we won't stay on that topic because I know a lot of people wouldn't understand it. But, uh, but the, 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 the God that we worship and serve him, he does whatever he wants to do, okay? <laughs> that means if, he wants to, if he's on the earth, and there's a law saying you should not kill, he want to kill somebody. I'm not saying he would kill somebody as a man, but the God, when he's exalted, because he is the law, he is the Torah. That means he does good and evil. And that's what he said. The man has become as one of us to, to as one of us. The man has become as one of us, not two of us, not three of us, has become as one of us to know good and evil. So, so who is that one that's in heaven that knows good, that will know good and evil? I would have to say that's the one that's coming. The one that already came, basically did not sin. He didn't know evil, all right? And let's go on. Thou fared in the children of men, grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore, God has blessed thee forever. All right. So, this God that's coming will come as the Son. He basically is in heaven. He's in heaven as the Father. But this is where the this is what a doctrine. It looks like the doctrine of the Trinity can be halfway right. All right. The God that's coming is in heaven as the Father. But when He comes, He's not going to leave heaven. He's still going to be in heaven, but his, he's going to manifest in the earth as the sun. And the, and the Hawashai was his lamb, was his sacrifice. I hope you understand that. All right, because many people, and Yah has dealt with me on this topic for years because of what he's shown me. All right? And like, if you, will, if you want to find somebody that thought Yahawashai was going to be the one coming, one doing judgment and justice and all of that, it was me because I thought Yahweh Shai was Yahweh. All right, but uh, it looks like, and I, I, I'm seeing this thing according to the way the Spirit has, has led me to see it. That basically he was the Lamb of God. He was the Lamb of the one that's coming. He was a, his perfect sacrifice. So this man would live in this world, and uh, Yahweh Shai even said it. He said, "There's coming a day you're gonna want to see one of the days of the Son of Man." What son of man? We've already saw the whole thing, all the way from his birth to his death in the Gospels. He was not, I don't think, well, let me put it this way. He was not talking about himself. All right. He was talking about another son of man. And in the, the Old Testament, scriptures talk about this person all the time. All right. The New Testament is kind of focused on Yahweh, but you can find him also in the New Testament. So we're going we're gonna to find him right here. All right. Now God has blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty. All right. It says, O mighty. Let's see. That's not Elion. Let me see. Look at that word mighty. The word most is in italics. Now, if it is said most highest, then it might be Elion. But let's see what this is real quick. Hold on just a moment. That means the that means it's, uh, it's 1368 in the Hebrew, the same as 1397. It means powerful, abdication warrior, tyrant, champion, chief, excel, giant, man, mighty man, strong man, valiant man. All right. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and majesty. And in thy majesty, ride prosperously because of the truth, because of truth, meekness, and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Now, this right here kind of is a giveaway a little bit. Let's look at this right hand. What's that right hand? Is that just hand? Or are they going to tell you right hand? 3225 in the Hebrew. Does that mean? Okay, it's right hand. 3225, the right hand or side leg, eye of a person or other object as the stronger and more dexterous. Locally, the south, left-handed, right hand, south, side, south. All right? 
So when it says that Yahweh Shai sat on the right hand of the Father in the heaven, it's kind of right here, it's kind of almost like a hint. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. It's calling him the most mighty. You know, gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with glory and majesty. And in majesty you ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. All right, so right here he's saying arrows. I want to show you something real quick in Revelation. And many people think this person, I want to go, I want to go back in history and come back to this little chapter. Many people in Revelation, we have uh, uh, people saying that the, the rider on the white horse in Revelation chapter 6, the first seal that's open is, uh, is Antichrist. All right. I'm going to show you, show you something real quick. That he can't be Antichrist. Now, the first seal that's open, because we see this thing going on in Revelation chapter 5 about the lamb opening up the seals of the book that's in the right hand of the Father that's in the hand of the Father. And when he starts opening up the first seal, he, he opens up and sees a white horse. And him that sat on it had a bow and a crown was given unto him. Now the crown is a Stephanos. It's a, basically, when you look at, when you study this crown, a Stephanos, it's a crown that's promised to believers, to overcomers. A crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering in the conquer. See that? So he had a bow. Let me read it again. Yeah. Okay, let me read this starting at verse one. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals. You know, it's the lamb opening up the seals, right? And I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow. So if he has a bow, that means he has some arrows, right? And a crown was given unto him, a Stephanos was given unto him. And usually your person, when, when you're talking about this crown, these overcomers crowns, it's talking about crowns that are going to be given at the coming of, of the Lord. All right, when he raises the dead, you get, you get overcome his crown. But this man is given a crown right at the top. All right, it's like he's the first one to get a crown. And I saw him behold a white horse and he just sat on him, had a bow and a crown was given unto him. He went forth conquering and to conquer. All right, now let's go back here where we was just said in Psalm chapter uh, 45. Obviously, this person with a white horse at that, how could he be the Antichrist with a white horse? All right. Now, as we see in Revelation 19, we see, uh, see a man coming who's king of kings and lord of lords riding on a white horse. All right. And we see the theme of a white horse with God and anybody else. As you see, the other horses are not white. That's in this seal, the, that's in the second, third, fourth seal. They're not uh, white. They're red, black, bay colored, according to what, what they're going to be doing, what their part, what their what their um, job is to do. This man is riding a white horse. All right, so that doesn't sound like Antichrist to me. As a matter of fact, my son and I was watching these movies. These movies called The Omen, that were made back in the seventies, and there's I think there's some in the eighties. Interesting movies about the Antichrist, about the man of sin. We're going to talk about that a little bit there, here too. All right, the man of sin. All right. So, thine arrows are sharp in the heart, verse five. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. So, in that vision I had, the king, the, the, the God, who, if that was God in that vision, which I believe, you know, it was, you know, I had a vision about God. All right, the Son of God, you know, and God Himself sitting on the throne, sitting in his, in his house. All right, all right. Thine, thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, and I saw before we entered into the house that he had enemies. All right, I remember it was a gang type, uh, as a gangster type uh, setting in the division I had, whereby the people fall under thee. All right, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. All right, so this throne right here, let's see, verse 6, is forever and ever. All right, the scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Now, this is where it gets strange at, because is this God, is Jesus God? Is this saying that Jesus is God or what? Because basically this God has a God. And then when you look at Jesus, 
when we see Jesus, we see him praying and asking God to glorify him with the glory he had with him before the foundation of the world. The glory that, you know, glorify him with his own self. I think this is in John chapter 17. He tells God, glorify me with your own self with the glory I had with you before the foundation of the world. Because y'all, you love me before the foundation of the world. I think that's what he said. All right. So he's praying and asking God for all of these things that you can tell that he's not God, he's not the most high. But this person right here is thy throne, O God, is forever and ever the skeptic of thy kingdom is a right skeptic. Thou love is righteousness and hated witness, therefore God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. This is why I say that the God that's in heaven, both of them, both of them are the same person. But the one that's going to be manifested here on earth it has to be this has to be also in the position of the son, and that makes the sense. That makes sense that Yahweh is the Lamb of God, and Yahweh in this vision that I had was the same age as me, and he was basically this, looked exactly the split image of me, except he was a perfect, like a a perfect man that never sinned, never done wrong, never ate anything wrong, that type of person. All right, uh, he was perfect. You could look at him and tell he was perfect, but a perfect image of myself. All right. And I was, what, 23 at the time. I was very young. All right. And uh, that that vision kind of tells me what this is all about. Why was Yahweh Shai looking exactly like me? All right. What was, he look, what was the whole point of this vision of him looking exactly like me? Was it because he was my sacrifice, maybe? All right. But anyway, but we know Yahweh Shai is being the... The the one is the is the one that saves the whole world. Like John the Baptist said, is the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. So the way I saw it at that time was that everybody he looks just like everybody that he's dying for, that he's sacrificed for. That's how I saw it at the time. But okay, and I'm gonna move on from there. But um, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever the skeptic of thy kingdom is a right skeptic. So the God that is coming. That hasn't came yet, Yahweh Shai looks exactly like him. Okay, and this man will be in the world. He's going to live a life in this world, not like Yahweh Shai did. Yahweh Shai lived in Israel. He was born in Israel, and uh, he went to he had to go to Egypt to escape uh, here the Edomites. And then when they, when he was dead, he came back and went to Nazareth, to the north of where they where they were supposed to really be living. He's supposed to be living in Judah. So they was of the tribe and inheritance of Judah, but they had to go to the the Galilean part of the country, right, and lived in Nazareth, where all of those people that were supposed to be living down there in Judah were at. You know, the, the house of David was in was in Nazareth and Cap Capernaum and Galilee areas at that time, and the ten northern tribes had been scattered uh, hundreds of years earlier, and that's where they had that's where their territory was at. But anyway, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever the skeptic of thy kingdom is the right skeptic. Thou lovest righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God. So the, the, so the point is, is here that this God that's coming is coming like as if he's a regular human being. But he's really Yahweh himself. When he first comes into the world, he's going to live a, like I have a, a destiny, like he's just a regular man. All right. He's going to be like that. And he's going to be praying to God, basically his father. But he's really the one that sits on the throne himself. All right. That means nobody will know who he is and he won't even know who he is. That's how he set it up like that. All right. He won't even know who he is until he gets to a certain point. Therefore, God, thy God has, has anointed thee with all the gladness of thy fellows. So you can see how Yahweh Shai was the perfect sacrifice for this person. All right. Now, Yahweh Shai knew who he was, but you can see how he was the perfect sacrifice for this person, because this person would be living like as if he was a regular man that needed to be have a sacrifice. that needed a lamb. OK. Um, thou, thou love his righteousness. Let me read it again and hate his wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God has anointed thee with all the gladness of thy fellows. All right. And we see this God. Let me close. Let me take you to another place. David did a psalm. Now, this, these are the sons of Korah that's doing this one. But David did a psalm in Psalm 20, I think it's Psalm 21. Let's see this real quick. 
And David is talking about the same person. All right, this is a, to the chief musician of Psalm of David. When it says to the chief musician, the chief musician was the second, normally the second person that was in charge in the temple area. You had the high priest and then you had the chief musician. All right, that means they were, they was jamming on some music in the temple. All right, so when you see the kingdom come, you, you better believe that that's gonna be some jamming on some music, all right? They're gonna be playing some music, gonna be some singing and everything. My wife told me before she passed that Yahweh, and we didn't know that she was gonna pass either because you know she got cancer and within the next year she was gone. But she told me that God spoke to her and said, sing for me in the kingdom. My wife and I both, you know, my wife is a singer and a musician, a recording, a recording musician and a singer too. And uh, we both were working on some music. And uh, she's very good, I have to say. She sang with the expressions of joy I had uh, a, a Midwestern gospel group of females back in this, what was that, back in the 80s? And she was young. She was a keyboard and background singer for, for some great singers. But he told her uh, a little bit before she got diagnosed, sing for me in the kingdom. So there's going to be some singers in the kingdom, you know? all right? Musicians going to be in the kingdom. And they're going to be getting down, all right? The king shall joy in, in thy strength, O Yahweh. Now tell me who this is. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Yahweh. He's gonna have he's gonna the, the key is this. And whose strength? In Yahweh's strength. Let me highlight this real quick. Now this is David. And do you think David knew who, who, who was going who was coming? And like, oh yeah, David knew. It's just like Abraham understood that God would provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Abraham knew what that meant, but most of us still today don't understand that. But the, the king shall, let me highlight this. King shall joy and thy strength, O Yahweh. That means the king will have, will have joy from Yahweh's strength. Can you imagine that? You know, Yahweh's strength and his joy is unlimited. But this king right here shall joy and thy, and thy strength. That means He's going to have Yahweh's strength. He's going to joy in it. Let me highlight that. Let me read this correctly. I don't want people to think I'm saying something that is not saying. He's going to joy, but he's going to joy in Yahweh's strength. So who is this king right here? Let's go on. And, uh, oh, Yahweh, and in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. That salvation, let's take a look at this salvation. Three, three four, 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 Hebrews. 34, 44 in the Concordians. Let's take a look at this real quick. Yeshua. We know that his name is not, this name is not Yahweh. Yeshua is really Yahweh. All right. I look at these little letters up here. I got a paleo um, alphabet that shows you how each of those letters is supposed to sound. You put it all together, it is Yahweh. But they they saying it's Yeshua. How they get Yeshua? Look at these vowel points now. The Hebrew, Palo Hebrew didn't have all these. What about this T, this point right here and that point? Uh, they just had the letters. All these points is telling you how to say this. But when you when you say it from the original Palo, it's Yahawashai. That's why you hear a lot of brothers saying Yahawashai is his name. But right here in Hebrews 34 44 is Yeshua. All right, really another name for Yahweh, another way of pronouncing his name. All right. So in, yeah, in, in, your, in his salvation, how greatly shall he, re he rejoice? And in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice? That means in your, in your Yahweh, how greatly shall he rejoice? All right. And that word means is a, is a passive participle of 3467. I think it means Yasha. All right, something saved that is abstractly deliverance. So that means this, this God has put himself in a position to be saved. That means, in a sense, he, he, he's Yahweh, but he put himself, he's, you know, there's a, there was a, there was a, a musician, uh, an escape artist back in the 20s or 1900s. I think his name was, uh, what was his name? Houdini or something like that. That means you could you, you could throw him, you can tie him up in chains and stuff, throw him down in a 
in a, in a, in a pool of water with bricks on him, and he would come up out of it. Houdini, I think that's what his name was. And his name's right, Houdini. You ever heard of Houdini? Huh? Yeah. Back in the 20s, 1920s? Yeah. But this God has put himself in the same type of scenario to come down and basically get saved and receive salvation. And that's when I say that this God, that, like I saw it in the vision, he met me. And uh, he was Yahweh Shai. It was obvious. That was, that's Yahweh Shai. Even though he looked just exactly like me, I knew it in the, in the vision that it was Yahweh Shai. All right? But this Yahweh Shai would be God's lamb. All right? He would be his sacrifice. All right? That's why I say it's in the night salvation. This king has Yahweh's strength, but in his salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice? And it's Yahweh Shai, how greatly shall he rejoice? And when I saw this Yahweh Shai, this, this Jesus that was looking just like me, he smiled like as if he was very happy. And he hurried up to the house, like almost like he was on a fast pace, to get to his father. All right? God has given him his heart's desire and has not withholding the request of his lips. All right? God has given him his heart's desire and has not withholding the request of his lips. So this, this person was God, basically, that David is talking about. All right? He has a request of his lips. Now we see Yahweh Shai praying in John 17 to the Father, but this person who is really God himself will be praying also to, I guess you could say his own person, his own self on the throne in heaven, because he's coming down not knowing who he is. And that's Psalm 49. You go through Psalm chapter 49, that's him talking right there. And he basically has to wake up from his sleep. Almost like the Hebrew Israelites are waking up in their sleep right now right, among the nations. He wakes up from his sleep and recognizes that he basically is spending his life uh, in vain. That he was working hard and all of that. He was spending his strength in vain. And he realized that Yah called him to wake up the children of Israel and to restore them. All right. And all of that. And this is Psalm 49. He doesn't tell you his name. But that's really this God that we're talking about right here. So thou prevented him with the blessings, with him. Okay, excuse me. For thou prevented him with the blessings of goodness, and set us a crown of pure gold on his head. So this this crown of pure gold is uh, not a stephanos, which the, you know we get a stephanos in the in the New Testament because it's translated from the Greek. But this crown, it's, uh, what is it? Diadem sixty three thirty seven in the Hebrew. Let's see, pause. All right, pure gold, hence gold itself. You find pure, find pure gold. So I don't even say it's a diadem when it just says he got gold sitting on his head. Okay, a gold, you know, crown, I guess. God said it's a crown of pure gold on his head. He has life for thee, and I gave it to him. And then today, so look at that, forever and ever. All right, he has life of Yahweh, and Yahweh gave it to him, and then today, forever and ever. Okay. Uh, his glory is great, and I, Yeshua, Yahweh shall. So what did Yahweh Shai come down here for? He didn't come down here to see, basically, Yahweh Shai didn't exactly come down here to sit on the throne. Believe it or not, he didn't come down here to just sit on, he came down here because he was going to be the lamb of Yahweh. He's going to be the lamb of God. That means he would have to, in order to be the lamb of God, he would have to be a, a king, all right? You know, when you think about this and you, you just put it together, it just makes sense. That if he's going to be the sacrifice for God himself, that's on the earth, he would have to be a king. He was born, Yahweh Shai was born, guess what? King of the Jews. So <laughs> I'm getting a little tickled by this, all right? So excuse me. He was born king of the Jews. So his sacrifice would be for a king because he would have to be a king, the sacrifice for a king. For that glory, they, you know, okay, let me go on. His glory is great and thy salvation, honor and majesty has thou laid upon him, all right? But thou has made him most blessed. Look at this. Let me highlight this. And we're going to go back to Psalm 45 in a second. But uh, I promised my nephew that I'd speak on Psalm 45. Psalm 45 is basically a, a psalm of love that this man is going to get married. We're going to go into that. Thou has made him most blessed forever. That means out of all people that ever lived upon the face of the earth, he would be most blessed forever. Okay? That includes more blessed than Yahweh Shai. 
God has made him most blessed forever. God has made him exceedingly glad with thy countenance. For the king trusted in Yahweh, and through the mercy of the Most High, that Most High right there is El Elyon. Let me look at it. Okay, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a stickler. I'm looking at these words, making sure that we know what word that is on the Most High. It got a capital H for high. Let's see, hold on. 5945 in the Hebrew. Elyon, there it is. And through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Thine hand shall find out thine enemy. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Who is the right hand again? And he sat on the right hand of the Father in heaven. All right, the throne in heaven, the power is in heaven. Thy right hand is, is Yahweh, not probably, but it is Yahweh. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. All right. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thy anger. Let me read that again. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thy anger. As we see in, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, we see the ancient of days come and he sits, he's sitting. And he basically has a fiery, fiery flame all around him. And we see in the, even in Ezekiel chapter, I think it's chapter 1, there's a fiery flame around the throne of God, around the throne of the Most High. All right, right here it says, Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. Yahweh shall swallow them up in his wrath and fire shall, do, shall devour them. So, you know, just look at this and you study this. Like I said, want to know who Yahweh is when he comes, all right? Because you might be, you don't want to be one of the ones saying, oh, that ain't Yahweh, all right? That ain't Yahweh shy, all right? And be wrong about it and suffer some consequences on that bad boy, all right? Thou shalt make them as a fury of in the time of thine anger. Yahweh shall swallow them up his wrath and the fire should devour them. So right here, it's telling us, and as Peter said, that the day of Yahweh is coming like a thief in the night, was which the heavens and the, the, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. All right. So he's using Yahweh's strength. So right here, let me read that again. Thine hand shall find out thine enemies, thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fairy oven in the time of thine anger. And Yahweh shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. All right, for our God is a, is a consuming fire. All right, so this person is coming. It's really Yahweh that's on earth, though there's a Yahweh in heaven. So that our kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, and as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that the first man was on the earth, earthy, the second man is Yahweh from heaven. Whenever you see the Lord by itself in the Greek and in, in the New Testament, it's most likely you're talking about Yahweh. That's Jesus saying the Lord from heaven. And it says the first man was of the earth early. The second man is the first man was made uh, of, let's see, how do you say it? The first man was made a living soul. That's how it goes. First Corinthians chapter 15. First, first man was made a living soul. The second man was a, is, is a quickening spirit. So when you look at that, the quickening spirit, that's not Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai was quickened from the grave by Yahweh. He was risen. But the second man is going to be a quickening spirit. That means he's going to be the one that raises people from the dead. There's only one, well, there's only one person that raises people from the dead to live forever. And that's Yahweh. So right there, 1 Corinthians 15 is saying that this quickening, this one that quickens, is Yahweh himself. Hold on just a moment. And I, you know, like I said, I get a lot of fun talking about this because really I had a, my own, I had a personal experience. That's how Yah revealed himself to me. All right, he showed me these things that I didn't understand at first, but now I understand it. All right, but the fire shall devour them. So we see in Revelation chapter six that uh, when we open up the sixth seal, that was uh, hold on just a moment. Let's get this down real quick. When he opened up the sixth seal, we see the 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 the, the sky, the firmament was rolled together like a scroll. And the people ran into the, to the dens and caves and rocks of the mountain. All types of folks, we see that in being you know, fulfilled as from Isaiah, that people are running and trying to hide from the glorious majesty of Yahweh. But they said, hide us from the one that sits on the, from the face of the one that sits on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. All right, you see that? You check that out? Hide us from the face of the one that sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. 
So who they really running from? They running from this man right here. All right. They they running from him when he shows up. What happens? What what what? How does he roll the scroll? The, the sky back like a scroll. Well, it looks like that he basically lives his life without people knowing who he is because he said, yeah, I wish I said it's going to come a day you're going to want to see one of the days of the Son of Man. You shall not be able to see it. For as, the, for as the lightning shines from the east and shines onto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That means the Son of Man is going to be caught up. Like Psalm 47 says, he's going to be, he's going to ascend from his position on earth. He's going to ascend and get caught up and he's going to come back down when it comes back down, that's going. That's when he's going to be like Yahweh himself. All right? But anyway, let's go on. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. Yahweh shall swallow them up in his wrath. And the fire shall devour them. And he's all of these enemies of ours. It's going to, he's going to get them. And really, to be honest with you, do the, do the enemy know this about our, our God, our king? As a people, we got, you know, we got the blacks. We got the African Americans, excuse me. You know, I'm going by names that they gave us. African Americans, Latinos, Hispanics, and Native Americans. Does the enemy know that the king of these people is like this? I think a lot of them do. They're not stupid. They know that that the one that's coming is the one that <laughs> needs to be feared. And they really they and the, the thing is, is that Psalm 83 says his enemies, that means they hate him. They hate this person right here. And they set up a world system like Yah, like Yah's the Houdini, and he allowed them to, to tie him up as tight as they could and see if they could take the kingdom. Basically, he said, tie my hands behind my back, my feet with my hands, and do throw me in the water and see if you can get the kingdom. That's like he, like he, like he, like he, that's kind of like what he's doing, all right? And he basically the fact is he's gonna get him for tying his hands back. And throwing them in the water, you're gonna get them for doing that too, because they did it. All right. And that's what the world, that's how the world is set up to basically try to keep Yahweh that's coming back to keep him to kill him if they could. If they could kill Yahweh, they would. And that's what that's what they're gonna get it. All right. But anyway, let me read that again. Thou shalt make them with a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. Yahweh shall swallow them up in his wrath, the fire shall devour them. Their fruit shall thou destroy from the earth. That means these people that fought against him even before he came, that set up a world system to try to give him trouble, to make him sick. You know, out of all, all the places on earth, you got more dangers in the food, in the air, in water, in America than any other place on the face of the earth. That means some of the stuff that America's allowed, most of the other nations basically outlaw. They say this stuff is dangerous, it's toxic, and they're trying to kill. They, let me, let me go on. I'm getting ticked off. All right. They're trying to kill some people. All right. And I think they're trying to kill off Yahweh Allah. All right. Because they they not stupid. If Yahweh is going to come somewhere to save his people, he's coming to America. I'm going to tell you that right now. His people are in America. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger, and Yahweh shall swallow them up in his, in his wrath. The fire shall devour them. Their fruit shall thou destroy from the earth, and their seed from among the children of men. That means when he takes them out, he's going to take them all the way out. That means he once he once he gets done with them, he's not gonna have to deal with them no more. All right. But they intended evil against thee. So look at this. Let me highlight that. They intended evil against thee. Against who? This man is sitting on the throne. They intended evil. When did they intend evil against them? They had that known his word. They read that Bible. They knew he was coming for his people. So they basically said, Oh, this God that sits on the between the cherubim and the, and the Ark of the Covenant. It's coming for them, so let's see what we can do to stop it. That's what it looked like they did. I'm going to be honest with you. All right? For they intended evil against thee. They imagined a mischievous device. Let's look at that word. They imagined a mischievous device which they are not able to perform. All right? They imagined this, all of this stuff that they're doing to his people, this is what they set up against him because they didn't want him to come and take the dominion. All right? Remember, there's two Adams. One was made a living soul. The other one, a quickening spirit. All right, and like they even made us think that that was Yahweh Shai coming, but it's not Yahweh Shai. They, because really that's what they want to believe. Oh, it's Yahweh Shai. Oh, we get along with Yahweh Shai. Oh, he's nice. He died for us. He died for us. That's what they, that's how they think about Yahweh Shai. They don't want to think that the one that basically is an Old Testament that didn't take no mess up anybody 
it's coming for his people. They don't want to believe that, all right? So they imagine a mischievous device which they are not able to perform. Let's look at that 4209. Mizamon, Mizamon, I think that's how you say it. From 2161, a plan. They had a plan, usually evil machination, sometimes good sagacity or wicked device, discretion, intent, witty invention, lewdness, mischievous device, thought, wickedness. All right, we probably could go to the, my other concordance, which is more exhaustive, but you get the idea. They imagine a mischievous device against who? Against the one that we're reading about right here, which they are not able to perform. You might think, you say, what people would literally fight against the one that created everything that they enjoy? All right, the whole earth, the heavens and the earth, the sky, the water coming down, water and the plants, the animals, and they, they created all of that. What people would fight against them would try to take them out? That would have to be somebody wicked and foolish. Therefore, shall that make them turn their back on Nasha McGrady? There it is, dying arrows upon the strings against the face of them. So we just saw Revelation chapter six, the first, the first seal is opened up is that basically you saw a, a white horse. He just sat up on him, was given a bow and a crown was put on his head. He went for a conquer and a conquer. And if he has a bow, that means he has crown. He has, he has, excuse me, he has arrows in the bow for the bow. All right, if he has a bow, he has arrows for it. Let me read that again. Therefore shalt thou make them turn their back when thou shalt make ready thine arrows upon thy strings against the face of them. All right, so that Revelation chapter six, verse one, that first seal is this man right here. He's sitting on a white horse. Now, duh. Oh no, it's the Antichrist. Sitting on a white horse? Come on, give me a break. He would be sitting on a red horse or a black horse. The Antichrist. Why is this man that's supposed to be evil sitting on a white horse? Oh, he's trying to trick somebody. Oh, give me a break. All right, but let's see, Psalm 21, 13, be thou exalted, Yah, in thine own strength. So we would sing and praise thy power. So right here is calling the man Yah. All right. Be thy exalted Yah in thine own strength. So we sing and praise thy power. So basically the strength that he's that he joined in, the strength of Yahweh is really is his strength because he is Yahweh. All right. In thine own strength, we will sing and praise thy power. Let's go back where we just said, Psalm 45. So if you're listening to me, you listen to me real good. It's not Yahweh. Yahweh is the lamb of this person that's coming. That means he's the sacrificial lamb. And he's the one that Yah used and created first, the first one that Yah created. Now remember, this one that's coming is really Yahweh, the same Yahweh that's up in heaven sitting on the throne. He's going to be down here on earth. Except when he comes down here on earth, he's basically like a regular man walking this thing out by faith, okay? So Yahweh Shai was his lamb. So by being his lamb, he became the one that sacrificed for the whole world because everything and everybody is in Yahweh. Believe it or not, it's in Yahweh. Everything and everybody, and they say it's in Christ, but Christ is the guess who is in who? He's in Yahweh, he's in the Father. The Father's in him, all right? Okay, let's see. Oh yeah, gird thy sword upon thy thigh, almost mighty, with thy glory, with thy glory and thy majesty. Psalm 45, verse 4. And in majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness. And thy right hand shall teach in righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Down barren arrows is what we just left off there. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The skeptic of thy kingdom is a right skeptic. Thou lovest righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, has anointed thee with all the gladness of thy fellow. Now, in Psalm, what is it? Revelation 21, it does say, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I hope he is God, and he should be my son. So, this person is going to inherit all things of this person that we're talking about right here. All right? And it does call Christ in another place. He is the heir of all things. So, in order for this person right here to inherit all things, Christ. His sacrifice, the lamb, had to be the heir of all things. I get it? You know, it makes sense. All right? He is to be the heir. So the one that is, was his lamb is the heir of all things. That means this person will inherit all things. All right? All thy garments smell of myrrh. 
All I got the smell of myrrh and aloes cast here out of the ivory, ivory palaces, whereby they have made thee glad. So this person is going to be a very, a very glad person. All right, he's going to be a very happy person. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen of gold, queen and the gold of opal. All right, king's daughters were among thine honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen and gold of opal. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear, forget also thine own people in thy father's house. All right, let's see. Okay, so the queen, so he basically we was talking about this, my nephew and I that basically this, this God, this King, which is really Yahweh himself, manifested as a human being. Basically, he's gonna have a wife. He's gonna have wives, wives, all right? He's gonna have wives. So we see this queen standing in gold of Oprah. It says, hearken, O daughter, and consider, incline thine ear, forget thine own people in thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is, thy Adon and worship thou him, all right? He's thy Adon, and right here is the word that normally says it calls somebody Yahweh, this is Adonai, but right here it calls him Adon, let's see, Hebrew 113. So can Yahweh be called Adon in the flesh? Yes, hold on just a moment. Let's see here. Adon, some people will say Adoni right here, but right here it shows us the way to pronounce this is Adon, because they don't have an E at the end of the, the uh, example of it. All right, so it's Adon, an unused root meaning to rule, sovereign, okay, let's think of that again, sovereign. That is controller, human or divine, right here. So a don could be, like I said, see it, it could be used for a human, a regular person, or a divine. That person could be a divine person or a regular human. Let me highlight that. Human divine, Lord, master, owner. All right. So the king shall greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Adon, and worship thou, look at that, worship thou him. Now there's two words that it, the Bible says that we're to do for the Yahweh All right, one is worship and the other one is serve. All right, this word for worship is uh, shakar. And you can do that for a regular king. And even Yahweh Shai got shakar. That means they bow down and prostrated and Promise to, to roll to your to God, to bow down, stuff to crouch, fall down flat, humbly beseech, do obeisance, to make reverence, to stoop, to worship. Okay. But the word serve, when the devil was tempting him and said, All these things will I give thee, and you thou fall down and worship me. Yahweh you know, said, It's written, Thou shalt worship the Yahweh thy Allah, and only him shalt thou serve. So you can worship anybody bow down and worship anybody, but only Yahweh should be served, all right? You should, you cannot serve any any other gods or any other Allah I am, all right? You can worship a king, that means give him, pay homage, or obeisance, but when it comes to serving somebody, only Yahweh should be served, all right? But he's telling the, this queen uh, that the king will greatly desire her beauty, for he is I Adon and worship thou him. All right, and if they worship in Yahweh, then they, they got it all together. And the daughter of Tyre should be there with a gift, even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. So this God, basically, he's seeing it right here. One that sits on the throne is gonna have a wife or wives. Now in the Hebrew culture, it was, we saw David had like 18 wives. Solomon had, he went overboard, he went ridiculous. 700 wives, 300 concubines. All right, but David was a man of Yahweh's heart and he didn't offend except in the, the case with Uriah's wife and Bathsheba. But he, out of all of that, you know, he didn't offend against Yahweh. He had 18 wives and 
he don't see Yahweh telling him that he had too many wives. All right. Now, in Hebrew culture and the law, which really is what really matters, the law, as long as you don't break Yahweh's law, you're all right. So David did not break Yahweh's law by having 18 wives. So the daughter of Tyre should be there with a gift, even the rich among the people, rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughters, the king's daughter is all glorious within her for her clothing is wrought of gold. So there's something about her, his daughter right here. <clears throat> she shall be brought unto the king and make needle raiment, raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be bought, they shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy father shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. So basically, he's going to have children after this situation. It's really something else, right? Really something else because he doesn't die. That means his trek on earth doesn't kill him. They sought to kill him, as we saw in Psalm uh, 21. They, they intended a mischievous device against him. They tried to kill Yahweh and coming down to bring the kingdom down here. And that, that makes sense that they don't want his kingdom, so they tried to kill him. <clears throat> okay? And uh, basically, he escapes, gets salvation. And he ascends, according to Psalm 47. And uh, we'll look at that. Let me see. Let's go there real quick. Psalm 47. He ascends into heaven. Now, even Yahawashai was taken into heaven. All right. But this one right here, he ascends. Now, this is a, this is a psalm of the son, sons of Korah. This is Korah also. So clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For Yahweh, most high, is terrible. He is a great king. Look at this. They just told the whole truth and nothing but the truth, all right? They didn't play with it. David was, David was giving you a little chance to believe whatever you wanted to believe, you know, while saying it. But the sons of Korah just told you who he is. Well, Yahweh, most high, is terrible. And guess what Yahweh is? It's terrible. He is a great king of all earth, of all the earth. That means that he's going to be the king that's sitting on the throne on the earth that's going to be down here, not in heaven, not that he's reigning in heaven over there. He's going to be in the, he's going to be in the heavens as king sitting on the throne there, like we saw in Revelation chapter four. But he's also going to be king on the earth, sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. All right, let's read that again for Yahweh Most High is terrible. He's a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, even the, excellent, the elect excellency of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. God, and here it is. God is going up with a shout. Let me highlight this. God is going up with a shout. Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. What does that going up mean? Let me highlight this first. That going up means he's, means he's ascended. All right. So what happens? Something happens where he gets Yahweh's power. That means his own power back. While he's reigning, right? He's living on earth. All right. Now we saw someone in what is it, the Matrix, Matrix One or Two, where he's on the phone booth instead of being zapped out of the phone booth, he just flies, just just takes off and flies. The, you know. All right. But this this guy is going to do the same thing. He's going up with a shout. Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. Let's see that word going up right there in the Hebrew is fifty nine twenty seven. Let's take a look and see what it says. Hebrew 59, 27, primitive root to ascend. Let me highlight this. To ascend. So the Old Testament is going to tell you about this God more, more than anything, all right? The New Testament is too, but I'm, I'm going to show you that in a little bit here. To be high or active, active mount. Using a great variety of senses. I'm not going to read this whole thing. But it means to ascend. God, God has ascended with a shout. And we see in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that when he comes back down, he's going to descend from heaven with a shout. But the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So he's going to go up with a shout, with the sound of a trumpet. He's going to come down with a shout and the sound of a trumpet. We did a video on that a couple of weeks ago. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our king, sing praises. But God is the king of all the earth. Let me highlight that again. 
the sons of Korah getting down, but whatever song, however it just sounded, because all these songs are really basically set to music, all right? Given to the chief musician for music. The God is the king of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. It's talking about here on earth, y'all. Princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. So what happens in the last day? Yahweh comes. It's the day of Yahweh. Now the day of Yahweh is, is likened unto the Sabbath day every week. All right? So when you to see the John in Revelation says that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. All right? It had to have been the day that Yahweh comes, but also that Lord's day is the seventh thousandth year that man has been on the earth. Right, it's a 7,000th year, which is basically another seven day. It's a seventh day day. All right, I hope I said that correctly. Let me go back here to Psalm 45. So this God, basically, as we see, the song, the son of the Korah really go all the way in on it. All right, David says it too. David um, basically tells you that he's God. But it's kind of a mystery for most people, and even to me. But this is how Yah saved me. This is how He uh, He manifested Himself to me, All right, showing me that who He was. Because, I, like I said, there's a man standing in the doorway. I asked, I asked Yah to save me and fill me with the Holy Spirit at home instead of in the church. I come from a family that was that was churchgoers. Now I know most Hebrew Israelites, especially in our day and time that's, that's in the world today, the young men. You know, the church is just jacked up. You know, but when I was a kid, the church still was at the last bit. They was ready to run out of gas, but they they was still a little bit going, you know, with that mission, with that uh, tradition. The church still had the tradition from the 40s and 30s and 50s that they were still, you know, doing it sort of right, you know. But uh, as the 70s and 80s come on, the church was jacked up. So, but they still had the spirit. And I asked y'all to save me, to fill me with the Holy Spirit at home. All right? Not in the church. I didn't want to be in that church system. And he did. When I got filled with the spirit, he took a breath. Took a breath in me. All right? And that's what Ruach means, you know? Let me see if I can find this real quick with the Ruach. I got my phone set up here. It's been... Let's see. Hold on just a moment. Ruach. And I was looking in, uh, what is it, Timothy? I'm going to show you the reason why I was looking in Timothy. All right. Ruach means spirit, wind. Reference, in reference to Ruach, or spirit of the supreme creator of the heavens and the earth. Yahweh Allahim. So, the Ruach is the spirit of Yahweh Allahim. All right. And then Yahweh, so I say, God is a spirit, and they that worship him as worship him in spirit and truth. So I asked Yahweh to fill me with the Holy Spirit at home. And he obliged. He, he did it. Also, by resemblance of breath, example, a sens sensible or even, or even violent exhalation, figuratively life, anger, unsubstantial by extension, a region of the sky. The resemblance, the resemblance spirit, but only as a rational being, all right? So basically, he took a breath in me, all right? Just like this word for Ruach in Hebrew says, he took a breath in me, and it was, it was rough. It was not a rough breath, but he took a deep breath and started basically yelled out. I guess you could say that was another language, you know, but I understood what he was yelling out. But, uh, <clears throat> But anyway, uh, where was we at? Uh, okay, so we're trying to get over here. That means that he's gonna have a wife. He's gonna have wives and daughters, children. He's gonna make his sons instead of his fathers. All right, instead of thy father, verse 16 in Psalm 45, instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. And I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. Okay. 
Um, so you have to read these things really good, read them very carefully. All right. But better believe it, the enemy, the people that 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 are going to church, Christians, which are really are basically, I hate to say it, are the enemies of, of the children of Israel, the true children of 12 tribes. They they're their enemies. Didn't they the, the the same folks that go to church that are Christians in this nation, didn't they take these folks, these same 12 tribes into captivity and oppressed them, made them slaves? You know, and when Yahweh, when Yahweh told Moses to write in Deuteronomy 28, 68, thou shalt be, the Lord shall bring thee back to get back again to Egypt in ships. You should be taken to, to Egypt again in ships where you would be sold into your enemies. So if this is the place, then the people that we were sold to basically were Christians. So you would be sold to Christians, which are your enemies. Then you should become their bond men and bond women and no man should buy you, all right? So basically Christians are the 12 tribes of Israel's enemies. And these are the people that's gonna get it when it comes. You know, I'm, I'm not just speaking for my own desire. I'm speaking what the Bible says, that people that, that are Israel's enemies, which are Christians, which enslave them, which don't want to believe that they're the Israelites, which fight against them whenever they say they're Israelites and call them anti some whenever they say that they're Israelites, all right? And they're getting themselves together. They're teaching themselves to not sin, to not do wrong. They're going to basically be mad and angry at that. Oh, my goodness. So that has to be an enemy that's doing it. You know? but, uh, but the people that 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 basically got to be careful of it, the people that are your enemies because they know and they don't want you to be these people. They don't want that because what? That forecast disaster for them. They don't want to hear that Yahweh is coming to, to take them out. All right? Now, when I say take them out, the whole, I'm not saying you're going to take out everybody that's not an Israelite. Because you see in, in, in Matthew chapter 25 that basically he basically gives the kingdom to those that when, when, when they've done it unto the least of these his brethren, they've done it unto him. When they basically have mercy on his people, they get the kingdom. That doesn't mean that they're going to be ruling exactly. It just means that they're going to be in a good place in, in, in Israel's rulership. God's is not going to forget the fact that they gave, they, they visited him when he was in prison, when he was sick. And it, in the hospital, they, they did things for him. He's not gonna forget those people, all right? But not all of those people that that are the race of these folks that enslaved Israel are gonna, are gonna get the kingdom. Most of them are gonna, they're gonna be destroyed. For one thing, they don't want God's kingdom to come, all right? But as you can see, this is really something else. It's a love story. Right here, as we saw in Psalm 45, right here. And you got to remember that when this, when the kingdom comes, it's, a, it's another marriage, all right? But it's called a song of loves, all right, by the sons of Korah, a miscue. All right? And as we see in Jeremiah, let's go to Jeremiah, that's talking about the, the, the new covenant. Let's see, hold on just a moment. Jeremiah 31. All right, because the new covenant is coming. Many people say, especially the enemies, are saying that we are already in a new covenant. They call the New Testament scriptures a new covenant. I, I do it every now and then too by mistake because I've heard it so much. Okay, even this right here, what is it called? The new covenant, but this is the correct terminology for we, what we do to read. Behold, the days come, see if you how that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. You may think because Yahweh died 2,000 years ago, we're in a new covenant. But remember this covenant, let me highlight this. This covenant, and this is where a lot of replacement theology has blinded the minds of, of these enemies. Because they think because it seems like God has done away with his people that he really did do away with his people. But what did Paul say? God forbid. All right, God forbid. Did God, did God do away with his people? God forbid, all right? So basically, even though Yah's disciplined them, handed them into the put them into the hands of the heathen and to of the enemies, 
they thinking that he's done away with the covenant that now he's chosen them as the as his new chosen people all right and they call the time that we're living in the days of the new covenant but what but the new, but the new, you got to just think of the old covenant old covenant happened in exodus chapter 20 i think 19 20 and it was sealed in exodus 24. all right that was the, that was the first covenant but israel broke that covenant so what did y'all have to do he had to form another another covenant has that covenant been formed yet no the blood has been shed to form the covenant but there's not a web there's not there's not been a supper yet so whenever you think of a covenant look at it like this it's like a marriage and it is marriage in, in israel's case you got a you got a marriage proposal like a man saying will you marry me with his on his knee with the ring in his hand and throw those are pagan customs i'm trying to get you to see in your, in your imagination how this thing go you got a proposal you got an acceptance by the bride the bride to be accepts the covenant then there is basically uh, uh, what is it? Bloodshed. Now the bloodshed. If you got children, you might want to shut their ears right now. When they go in to the to the marriage chamber, the marriage, the bride should be a, should be a virgin. She's a virgin. She's gonna bleed. Okay. So the blood there's got to be bloodshed. And after the bloodshed, after they come out of the marriage chamber, all right, there's gonna be a covenant confirming meal. So there's a, there's a proposal, agreement, bloodshed, covenant confirming meal. So we see this happening in Exodus chapter 19 through 24, where there was a proposal, Yah proposed to Israel, all right? Israel said all that Yahweh said we would do, they accepted it. There was blood, there was some, there was some priests there that went and sacrificed some bulls. When Moses took the blood of the animals that were sacrificed and sprinkled it on the book of the covenant and on the people. Said this is the blood of the covenant, which is shed for you. And then when the when the when the blood was shed, Yah called Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel to the top of the mountain and then and to eat for a covenant confirming meal for all Israel. And uh, when that when that happened, they saw God, but he was standing on a what is it, a, a sapphire stone. They saw the God of Israel and they ate and drank. All right. But they broke the covenant. So when is the covenant going to be renewed? The covenant was not renewed exactly 2,000 years ago when Yahweh shed his blood. That was, a, that was just the bloodshed part. All right? Remember covenant, uh, covenant, excuse me, a proposal, acceptance, bloodshed. So Yahweh blood shed his blood 2,000 years ago for the covenant, for the new covenant. Is that, does that mean that we are in a new covenant? No, because you got to you gotta steal a covenant you got a covenant confirming meal that still could be done. And as we can see, right, if I want to, I don't want to go from here. I, I want to stay on this right, on this chapter. As you can see, there is in Revelation, we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? The marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be the new covenant. That happens after the destruction of mystery Babylon the Greek. And who does the destruction? Who does the destroying? Yahweh Allah. There's the destroying of the, of, the, of the whore, the great whore. After the destruction of the great whore, then there's the marriage supper of the lamb. At that marriage supper, you will see Yahweh again in glory. Just like you saw him standing on the uh, sapphire stone in Exodus chapter 24, and they saw God and they eat and drink. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to be with his people. All right. We see this happening in Revelation chapter 7. The one that sits on the throne shall dwell among the people. All right. So that's basically the new covenant, but there's not been a covenant confirming meal because the marriage supper of the Lamb hasn't happened yet. So let's read this Jeremiah 31 31. Behold, the days come, say of you, how that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So with both houses, the house of 10 tribes of the house of Israel and with the two or three tribes of the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. They break, although I was a husband unto them, said Yahweh. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more any every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know Yahweh. 
for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, said Yahweh. I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember them no more. All right? So when this happens, it hasn't happened yet. So we're not in exactly the new covenant yet. The blood of the new covenant has been shed, but the covenant confirming meal hasn't happened yet. Covenant confirming meal hasn't yet. So the covenant confirming meal hasn't happened yet. That means it can, when the covenant is confirmed, then that then the covenant, then, then there will be a new covenant. But it hasn't happened yet. And it's with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not with the not with the nations, not with the not with the heathen. He's never made a first covenant with the heathen in the first place. All right, so let's go back where we at. Uh, so I hope you get that and understand it. So this all this Old Testament scriptures talking about God coming and reigning and sitting on the throne and all of this is the new covenant. So if you haven't seen Yahweh sitting on the throne in Jerusalem and all of that, you haven't seen a destruction of the Israel's enemies, basically. Uh, what is it called? Uh, a vengeance that's taking taking place around the whole world for what has happened to these people, and they they haven't been restored. I know that there's people running around saying that Israel was restored in the 40s, 1940s. All right, I know that they're saying that, but uh, but no, when it, when it really happens, the whole world gonna know it, and there will be a king. As we just saw, what was that it's in Psalm 47? There will be a king that's going to sit up on the throne of the world. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let me go down here. Let's try David's thing. There will be a king sitting, uh, sitting down. All right. The king shall join thy strength, O Yahweh, and thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. What king is it? The same one in Exodus 24 that's standing on the sapphire stone. And they, they ate and drank and saw the God of Israel and ate and drank. That king, that's the one that's going to be sitting on the throne. Okay. All right. I hope that's understood. But what about this king? Let's get a little bit more on him real quick. We see that he's going to be even married in the kingdom. Not just spiritually, but he's going to have physical wives or whatever. And that's going to be hard for people to, to catch on to about him, all right? Uh, let's see here. Hold on just a moment. There's some things I wanted to look at real quick before we end this Bible study. So if you want to be a part of this kingdom, definitely you got to basically have the faith of Jesus, keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. All right. You won't be breaking your house commandments and be able to make it to the kingdom. All right. Now, here's something right here. Uh, let me see. I don't know if anybody can see what I'm looking at right here. I want to make sure you can see it. Right. Hey, Aaron, uh, Drake, can you see that new thing I just pulled up? Hmm? I don't see the green around it. It lets me know we can see it. You see the uh, olive tree application? Okay, just a moment, everybody.
So yeah, you want to keep the commandments of Yahweh and have the faith of Yahweh Shai. You want the kingdom. So yeah, I can see the olive tree and also the sword. Oh, can you see both of them? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's show you something. Um, the other day, the other day, uh, I had an attack, the devil, he attacked me. And I, you know, I come out of the hospital in September and I'm still recovering from my right side. I had a stroke because my blood pressure went down too low. All right. And the devil attacked me because uh, during the night, I had uh, been woke up by the spirit to look at some things in the scriptures. Um, and as I was looking at these things that God had given me to look at, uh, Double didn't like it, I'm gonna tell you. I mean, my son went through some things, even you know, as he uh as he was going to work and coming home from work, he went through some things too. Supernatural phenomenon. All right. And I want to share with you what I studied, what y'all gave me to study. Because along with the, the, the refraining from the Sabbath day. Which has something to do with the mark of the beast. <clears throat> There's also something else that the devil is doing to fight against Yah's kingdom. Because we know that he's set up mischievous device against the king. It was just read in Psalm. What Psalm was that? Uh, <clears throat> Psalm 21. They set a mischievous device against the one that's coming. So, what mischievous device are they, have they set up? Okay. Let's see, I wanna show it to you. One of the things, and I was studying, I was looking at some things because they, I was looking at a video and I'm gonna show you that video in a second or two. About uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine says, know you not that the unrighteous should not inherit the kingdom of God. So what unrighteous is, 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 is not inheriting the kingdom of God? I'm gonna tell you, the reason why a lot of these things going on about, uh, about the sexuality, and I don't wanna go too deep into explaining this, about uh, people that have different sexualities and they want their rights because of the way that they have sexuality. Uh, they want it to be, they want rights on it, you know? The reason why is because through this, remember how Sodom and Gomorrah was judged. In the latter day, it's going to be judged. So you have it in the beginning, Sodom and Gomorrah, you have it in the end. And that's where we get Revelation chapter 11, that they laid on the street of, this, of the, the city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. So it's not the literal Sodom and Egypt, but it's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. But let's, let's go here real quick before we go, go there and search that out. It says, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators. Now this word for fornicator right here is, is Greek 4205. Let's take a look at this. All right. Normally that fornicator is 4202, which, you know, females and all of that is talking about women, you know, uh, heterosexual fornication. And you see that a lot with the great whore when it's talking about her fornication, you know, all nations were deceived. By, by her fornication. Pornos, right? 4205 in the Greek. A male prostitute. All right? 4205, a male prostitute. So what is it talking about here? We're not talking about females. Male prostitute, uh, as Vino, that is by an analogy of debauchee, libertine, fornicator, hormone. So a male prostitute is what it's talking about. All right, hold on just a moment. Now, what I'm getting to is that, that uh, how they're gonna fight against this man is really Yahweh. It's, it's, 
There's a reason why Yahweh came down in the very beginning to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He heard about it, but he come down to see. What, why was he coming down to see if he knows everything? Because he was gonna, he's gonna basically uh, experience it himself. Is what he basically was saying. All right. So neither fornicators or idolaters. We know idolaters have something to do with worshiping idols. All right. That means people that don't love the God of Israel, they worship idols. All right. A base or an image servant or worshiper. All right. It's simple. No adulterers. We studied about that, uh, adulterous people. Uh, men sleeping with married women. All right. You will not get the kingdom. Now watch this. I'm going to look at that word adulterer. 34, 32. Let's take a look at it real quick. 34, 32. Paramore is the key to that. Uh, apostate, adulterer. All right. No effeminate. What is effeminate? 31, 30, 31, 20. We're effeminate. We might not get it. So, so here's the second word that we can see that has something to do with, uh, with uh, male homosexuality. All right, 31, 20. Of uncertain affinity, soft, that is fine clothing, figuratively a catamite, effeminate, soft. So what they used to call in ancient days, uh, the effeminate people was catamites. I don't know where that word comes from. It's called malakos, but it's called a, a catamite in the Greek. All right. And I think it's called it in the Old Testament too, from when you look it up, catamites. No abusers of themselves with mankind. Take a look at that. Greek 733. And this is on the top of the list of those that won't make it into the kingdom. So what you would what, what Reason why I was looking this up because it was it was saying something. Hold on just a moment. Greek seven thirty three, and the word is ar arsenokoites. 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 I think that's it. Yeah, the correct is good to say it. All right, a sodomite, abuser of uh, abuser of that defiles self of mankind. Sodomite. It didn't say this person was effeminate. That means this person probably will abuse will abuse his own self with their feminine. That means he's the man. The feminine is a woman, but they both males. All right. So basically, what Yah was showing me, and now we have the other in verse ten and verse eleven. These covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. All right. And such was some of you, but you are washed. You are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. All right. The problem with this is this: is that there's going to be a lot of people saved. Let me get it like this: God was showing me there's going to be a lot of people saved, but not everybody's going to get the kingdom. Why? Because they, they a lot of people are going to be caught up. Let me highlight this real quick. And I'm not saying. That I'm perfect or anything in any in any shape, form, or fashion. But uh, I will protest what is what it needs to be some protests. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. It's at the top of the list. Why is it at the top of the list? Because this spirit, this spirit fights seriously against Yah's kingdom. That means you, the, the worstest people that are strongest against Yah's kingdom are in the church. Like they're calling themselves Christian, except they're caught up into this Sodom, the spiritual, like I said, spiritual Sodom in Egypt. They're caught up in the spiritual Sodom in Egypt. Okay? And Yah was showing me this the other night, and that when I got up a little later on to go to the bathroom, the, the devil tried to throw me. <laughs> It did throw me into the bathtub, okay? He is angry and upset. That's how I knew that this is not just a sin. This is basically the man of sin's spirit, all right? You know, we see it, what is it called? Uh, and what is it? Let me go to First Thessalonians chapter 
First Thessalonians, or Second Thessalonians, chapter two. It's the man of sin spirit. That means he's 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 strong in this. All right. And we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, nor neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. And no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except they come and fall on the way first, and that man of sin. I mean, I like this. So basically, a person's spirit tells you all about him. All right? That this man of sin would be so powerful. His spirit is strong in the earth. Why? Because they worship him. They worship him. I mean, we just saw idolatry as one of the sins that's on the top of the list, along with these uh, Sodom, Sodomite sin. Right? And that man of sin be revealed the son of addition. And I want to take you here to Revelation chapter 11. If I can, if y'all allow me to, to oppose it in his so this man of sin, and he wants me to say here, this man of sin, is, his spirit is sodomite, all right? And this is the reason why they won't get the kingdom. Now, that doesn't mean people that, that has these problems that participate in them and just can't overcome them won't be saved. That means they won't have eternal life. That doesn't mean that. It's just that they won't get the kingdom. And what I mean by the kingdom, the kingdom is God's rule on the earth. The rule of God on the earth. It means there's going to be a certain people that's going to be ruling with God and the Lord Jesus or Yahweh Shai on the earth. These people that's like, like this, the Sodomite spirit, won't be ruling with God on the earth. All right? But it's going to fight. It's going to have a strong fight against Yahweh to keep his kingdom from coming. And the major place where it's fighting from is from what we call religion, from church, from those that believe. And those that believe, who, and it says, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshiped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. All right? So this is what he's going to fight against Yahweh. How do you know? Let's go here. Revelation chapter 11. And while we're going there, it says, uh, Remember you not when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withhold it, that he might be, be revealed. And it's time. I'm going to show you something real quick. It says, the mystery of iniquity does have already work. Only he who now let it will let until you be taken out of the way. The way taken out of the way is where you're going to find out what, how this thing happened. It says, until he be taken out of the way, he that let it will let until you be taken out of the way. All right. Let me see, where's that word at? Week 1096, let's see. There it is, Gnomahe. In the book of uh, Exodus chapter, in the book of Exodus chapter three, when the, when the angel shows up in the burning bush and Moses asks him, what is your name that I'm, when I, when I go to Israel and I tell the children of Israel that Yahweh has sent me to deliver you. And they say, what is his name? And he, and he said, well, tell them I am that I am, which means Ahaya Asher Ahaya. When you look at the word Ahaya, it's the same word it's the same word and same meaning as Gnomahi in the Greek. All right, and what does it, Ahaya mean? It means to cause to be. Look it up, excuse me. Look it up and, and, and look up uh, Exodus chapter three and he says, Ahaya, Asher, Ahaya. Then he says, my name is Jehovah. This is the from generation. Why did he say Ahaya, Asher, Ahaya? He was telling Moses what, it, what, was, what he was gonna do. So in the latter day, he was telling him what he was gonna do in the latter day. That he was going to become. So, to, so it says to cause to be, that means to generate, that is reflexive to become. That means he's going to come down like what we've been talking about. Yah is going to come down just like he did on the mountain after the covenant confirming meal, doing the covenant confirming meal where he, they was eating and drinking, and he was standing on a sapphire stone. He didn't lay his hand on any of the children of Israel. They saw God and they drank. But well, that's what he wanted to happen. He wanted to dwell with his people, but he couldn't because they broke the covenant. They would break the covenant. But this is what this is what's going to happen right here. He's going to become. But he was, is, and is to come. He's going to come into being. Let's look at this. So when it says that 
now you know where we're folded. And Paul is saying, now, I think that's Paul, yeah. Now you know where we're folded that he might be revealed in this time. And it's coming to being. All right, let's go there real quick. So he's going to become. That means he's going to come to Israel. He's going to really be with his people. All right. It says, for the mystery of iniquity that has already worked, only he will now let it, will let until he be Genomahi. What happens? He has sinned. Yahweh has sinned. So really, when in the latter day, Yahweh is going to be in a, in a human state. And as long as he's in a human state, all right, the mystery of iniquity is just working. He, you know, it's just working, it's working and working and working. As a matter of fact, the devil wants this to go on forever, just like it is going on today. But when this man is taken out of the way, that means when he has sins, what we just saw in the scriptures, Psalm uh, 47, that he's taken up into heaven with a shout. And Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet, when he's taken out of the way, verse, verse 8, or second Thessalonians chapter 2, then shall that wicked be revealed. So what's keeping him from being revealed? Yahweh not becoming. So he's going to be in the world in the latter days where it's going to be so wicked. But when he's taken, when, he's, when his job is complete, all right, when it's time for him to be revealed like lightning from the east to the west, he's going to be taken out of the world. He's going to sin. So let me read that again. For the mystery of iniquity that have already worked, only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Who'll be taken out of the way? And to Yahweh, that one that is really Yahweh, that's the king that sits on the throne taken out of the way. What happens to him? He goes up, he gets glorified. While that happens, when that happens, this wicked is going to basically try to take his position as Yahweh and sit on the throne. And when it then shall that wicked be revealed whom Yahweh shall consume and to say Jesus Christ is basically saying Lord without any Christ on it whom Yahweh shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. <clears throat> Hold on just a moment. And with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all may be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure and unrighteousness. So what happens? Who's taken out of the way? It's Yahweh that's in there in a human position. The one that's in the Exodus chapter 24 that's standing on the sapphire stone. He's gonna come down and be in a human position. And he's gonna basically fulfill all of that he needs to fulfill. He's gonna sin and with a shout with the sound of a trumpet. All right? And when that happens, this wicked will be revealed. Right here, let me highlight that. Why is the wicked being revealed? Because he wants to be in that place of Yahweh. When he sees that happen, He's going to right away say, I'm, I'm, I'm him. I'm the, I'm the God that sits on the throne. That's what, he's going to do that right off the bat when he sees what happened. And what causes it to happen, because in Revelation chapter 12, and look at it in Revelation chapter 12, there's a woman that's basically given birth to a son. She has 12 stars on her head, the moon on her feet. All right. And uh, that, there's a dragon that's trying to destroy the child as soon as it's born and standing before the woman. All right. What happens? He gets, he gets caught up in the God and his throne from her womb. She gives birth to a child, man. As a matter of fact, to a man child. So it is, it's a fulfillment of Isaiah 66. She gives birth to a man child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. He's caught up in the God and to his throne. Now, just look at that. Caught up into God and to his throne. All right. Who is that? And then there's war in heaven. After this man is caught up in the God and to his throne, there's war in heaven. Satan is, is fighting against Michael, and Michael kicks Satan and his angels out. And Satan and his angels come down to earth. The voyage war down here on earth. What happens when Satan and his angels kicked out of heaven? Here comes the son of man. Here comes that, that one that sits on the throne right behind him. All right? And what happens when he comes down? He destroys him with, this, with the spirit of his mouth, and he destroys him with the brightness of his coming. All right? So right off the top, this wicked right here, after he gets kicked out of heaven, which is going to be a, him, this is going to be Satan and taking over this man right here. He's already got him. All right. 
And this is the one I'm saying that basically has the spirit of Sodom all, Sodom all over. All right, so the wicked, this, that, so that wicked shall be revealed when that happens, when Satan is kicked out of heaven. Because the son of man is caught up to heaven, so the man child is caught up to God. That's what that word that we just looked at, Konoma, he means that he, he becomes. All right. He becomes, just like in Exodus chapter 3, the word uh, Ahaya means to become. So what happens? God becomes and he's come to dwell with his people. All right. Exodus chapter, what is it, chapter 29. At the end of that, in verse 40, I think somewhere around there, he says that he bought the Israel out of Egypt, that he might dwell with them. All right. He did that from the beginning, but he couldn't dwell with them because they broke the covenant. They were not faithful. So that's what's going to happen. All right. But what he's talking about, let's go to Revelation 11. And you can see this, that this is the last battle that takes place with Yahweh against his enemies. All right. Revelation 11 were the two witnesses. Two witnesses on the earth. A lot of this is symbolic, but the two witnesses are the two houses of Israel, like the 144,000 exactly, pretty much. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which is called spiritually. And the key to this is spiritually. Let me highlight this. So Satan not only has a fight with what is real evil against the, the children of Israel, but he has a fight from the church, the Christians, with the so-called Christians, whether they're black, white, or whatever race they are, which is basically, they're basically spiritually Sodom and Egypt. That's why he said that those people that's caught up in that sin when I get the kingdom shall, I, shall not inherit it. Now, Paul did say, but you are washed, you're clean, you, you're justified. Talking about the ones that have turned from it. But when I was studying this and God was showing me that, that this will be the last battle against a very powerful spirit, which is Sodom in Egypt. And that Sodom, spiritually, is Sodom. As we see Yahweh come down with two angels in the book of Genesis, talking to Abraham and what he's good to do. He went into Sodom to see if it was so. He was going to experience it itself. So this, this one that sits on the throne will come down in the latter days and experience not only this, this Sodom that uh, he saw in Sodom in, uh, in the beginning, he's going to experience a spiritual Sodom in Egypt. All right, it's not going to be obvious. It's going to be spiritual Sodom in Egypt. This Sodom is going to be doing all the evil, all the stuff that comes after that, that uh, fornication and feminine and abuses of themselves with mankind that would not near the kingdom, all of those other vices, spiritual vices that it mentions. All right, that's that comes along with this Sodom in Egypt. They of the people in countries and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead body to be put in grave. I mean, I, you know, it's obvious right here. They shall not suffer their dead bodies. It says they shall see their dead bodies. How, how does that go? Three days and a half. That's 350 years from the time of slavery until 1969. All right. And then there was an awakening. After 1969, there was an awakening going on for a while. The children of Israel waking up, they come by standing up on their feet. But uh, they shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in grave, that means they shall not be given a memorial. All right, it's explaining who these people were, how long they lived, how, you know, like a headstone. All right, they would not do that because they don't want they don't want people to know, they don't want them to be reminded of who they are. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and they marry, shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. You're telling people that Edomites and all of that and that what's gonna come, what's gonna happen to them? Yeah, they were tormented. I see a lot of times I watch these videos, I see these people scared. And I'm not saying that they it's wrong to scare them. They need to, they, 
basically when the devil basically try to remind you of your past, once you've done wrong, you broke God's law, you remind him of his future. I've heard that many sayings from these same people. When the devil reminds you of what you've done wrong, you're breaking God's law and love, remind him of his future. And that's what these two prophets did. They reminded the devil of his future. And they was tormented when they reminded him of it. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood up on their feet, and a great fear fell upon them which saw them. They heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now, when it says in Psalm 47, Yahweh ascended with a shout, and you know, God is going up with a shout, and Yahweh with the sound of the trumpet. Psalm 47. I can imagine, and, I, and I, if, I, if I'm wrong, I come back and, and, and basically explain it to you that I was wrong. But I can imagine when Yahweh ascends, he's taking the 144,000, these two witnesses with him. So they go up with him. In other words, not, not at the same time, he probably, he probably go up and they're following right behind him. As we see in Micah chapter, what is it, Micah chapter 2? The, the, breaker is going, going, the breaker is broken forth and going up. And the others right behind him. All right, talking about the breaker. This is the breaker, Yahweh is that breaker that is broken out. I mean, he was not supposed to break out, but he broke, broke forth. And it's going up and, and the, uh, the other sheep right behind him. All right. Uh, let's see. In the same hour was that great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and earthquake was slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. And right at that, when I got up that morning, after Yahweh showed me this about the uh, Sodom in Egypt, the spiritual Sodom in Egypt, uh, I saw a video of a lady that was a Christian that was talking about. The earthquake, the volcano is set to erupt, and people are noticing it. That the, the, the volcanoes are leaking. It look, look like at any time now, they could blow. And we're talking about right here on the west side of America, a great earthquake. And uh, basically, I was looking at this, and the spiritual side of in Egypt, and then the same hour was that great earthquake in the tent party. So basically, when these people are going to be delivered, and at that same time that this happens, that those volcanoes are going to blow. Now, I don't mention volcanoes here, but the effect of those volcanoes are going to create a great earthquake. The volcanoes are to erupt. All right. Let's see. When the second world has passed, behold, the third world coming quickly. The seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven. Now, remember in Revelation chapter 10, <clears throat> It speaks and says when the, when the voice of the seventh angel begins to sound, all the prophecies that are written in the Old Testament will, will be fulfilled. All right? They will be fulfilled. So what we just read in Psalms chapter 47 and Psalm 21 about the Son of Man, that God, that, that King sitting, voila. But anyway, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world from the kingdoms of our Lord. And it says Lord, right? It's not meaning Lord Jesus Christ. It's talking about the Lord, Yahweh. From the kingdom of Yahweh and of his Christ, of his Messiah. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders were set before God on their throne. And they seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. Saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty. That right there in the Hebrew would be O Yahweh. Al Shaddai. Yahweh Al Shaddai. And uh, this, this is the God that's going to deliver Israel. Yahweh Al Shaddai. Which are, and it really is in the, in, in the English, it's called Yahweh Almighty. Yahweh Al Hayam Almighty. But the word in Greek and the Hebrew is, all, is Shaddai, in the, in the Hebrew word for Almighty. Which are, was, and are to come. Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reign. But basically, when he gets victory over the Sodom, spiritual Sodom in Egypt, he's going to be taken to him as great power and reign. Only Yahweh could do that. That means he came down in human flesh, in the regular uh, human flesh. All right. He's coming down in that regular human flesh, and he's going to go in the, like he just did in. I think it's Genesis 21, when he went into Sodom and Gomorrah with the two angels. He's going to go in there again 
except this, this whole world system is like that. It's gonna come out victorious. Right here it says, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. That means he reigned when he was on the earth, when he, was, when he didn't look like he was reigning. He was reigning because he was getting the victory over these things. And the nations were angry and thy wrath has come in the time of, thy, of the dead, that, it, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and should have destroyed and was destroyed the earth. So Yahweh was going to experience himself the toxic air, the toxic water, the toxic food. All right, he's going to go through that himself. And it does say early on, let me go back up here, that the two witnesses lay, were the, lay in the streets of the great city, which is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. You know, they didn't say the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. It's talking about another crucifixion, another suffering. Or Yahweh, or Yahah, or Adonai, or Don was crucified. Let's look at that 47 17. So he was crucified. How was he crucified? All right. So he suffered some type of way. All right. Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So that means he's going to go through suffering from Sodom and Egypt, a spiritual Sodom and Egypt. As would his people, as well as with his people. All right, sterile, sterile to impale on the cross figuratively, to extinguish, to subdue passions, but selflessness, crucified. So, so he would, uh, right here, have the first word is to impale on the cross. And it said figuratively to extinguish or subdue passion or selflessness, crucified. So basically, part of his overcoming is that he subdued his passions and his selfishness and basically went through the suffering, suffering, all right? But this Lord that's crucified right here is in Sodom in a place called, spiritually called Sodom in Egypt. It's not 2,000 years ago. This is in the future. This is in the present. Probably either in the present or future, this would happen. That this Lord right here, this Adon or Adonai, will be crucified in a certain way, will suffer. How would he suffer? He's something that is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. And that's the reason why they're not, they're not going to get the kingdom. All right? So that means that could be Hebrew Israelites that are still caught up into spiritual Sodom and Egypt. All right? And though they're going to have eternal life, they won't get the kingdom. All right? And it's part of the reason why it's so dangerous because that spirit is part of the man that's sin spirit. The man is sin, the one that's coming, that's going to try to take Yahweh's throne, is part of his spirit. And his spirit is so strong, he can cut it with a knife in this area of Sodom and Egypt, especially Sodom. All right. I'm going to show you something real quick. If I can, I'm going to show you a little bit of the video I was watching a little earlier. So we see that Yahweh rained down fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven. All right? So that should tell you what we're talking about is true. Let's see. I want to show you fair use disclaimer real quick before we do this. Fair use, federal law allows citizens to reproduce, distribute, or, or exhibit portions of copyrighted motion pictures, videotapes, or video discs under certain circumstances without authorization of the copyright holder. This is called fair use and allow for purposes of criticism, news reporting, teaching, parody, which doesn't infringe on, on uh, the copyrighted copyright under Title 17 USC, whatever, 107. All right. <laughs> Hold on just a moment. Let's go back to the video. Site uh, called Lopoli Camara. And this is the site that the archaeologists associated with Gomorrah. So here you can see 
the ashy layer that's just underneath the surface. Uh, this is full of burned pottery. It's full of the fragments of human bones. The question is, is what evidence is there of this burning sulfur that rained down? Well, it seems that the culprit are these sulfur balls that are also found in this area. So you see the sulfur bowls, or as you go to Genesis chapter 21, I think it is, where that really happens, Genesis 20 or 21, uh, Yahweh rained down fire and brimstone from, the, from Yahweh, which was in heaven. But Yahweh was on the earth delivering Lot out of Sodom and, Sodom and Gomorrah, and his daughters, his family. And he rained down fire when they were ready, when they were saved. He rained down fire from Yahweh. Yahweh rained down fire from Yahweh. All right, let's let's go on forward with this. Let's show you a few things real quick because remember he's coming in flame and fire again. Yeah. Hold on. Hand some in your logo sticker. You put your brand out into the world because as an uh, early bronze site back in 1924, it was excavated in the 1960s and 1970s. And what archaeologists found here was this uh, burn destruction that goes across this site. This city came to an end um, through a fire destruction. So here you can see this uh, ashy burn destruction layer uh, just underneath the surface, full of human uh, bone fragments, burn pottery, and it's covering the entire site. So off in the distance here, you can see uh, Baba Dra, uh, identified as Sodom. And then right here to the southwest is this massive cemetery that you can see with all these pits that mark. Well, I want to explain to you is that you see the Baba Dra, which is Sodom. Um, you can see it. Let me see. Let me get my pointer. Behind his head, he pointed to it. We can see a lot of buildings and stuff. You see a building right there is covered. Covered with whatever it's covered with. But right over here, you can follow my point if you can see it. There's a graveyard. And in the graveyard, he even destroyed the graveyard, which showing you that he was not only destroying people that were alive, he was getting them dead too. That's what you always said. Now fear not him who he's killed a body. After you're killing the body, can do nothing to you. But fear him who after he's destroyed the body, and destroy your soul and body in hell. All right, so you're going to see in a second or two that the bones were even warped, warped that they saw from the, he even he even destroyed the graveyard, in other words. Hold on. It's boundaries, and these are formed because of the local decades have been caught and digging to these great looking for antiquities to sell in the antiquity market. And so it's estimated from the archaeologists that dug here back in the 60s and the 70s that there are around a half million people buried in this cemetery. And uh, it's just staggering. And, and what's really intriguing then is that they found a burn destruction across the cemetery that happened at the same time that the city was destroyed. So the city and the cemetery were destroyed in the same fire disaster. And uh, there's no reason why an army would attack a bunch of graves and burn a cemetery. And so this was one of the major reasons that they interpreted the destruction here as being caused by a natural disaster. In the excavation report, they show pictures of the bones in the graves that were warped by the heat. You have to wonder why Yahweh would attack the cemetery too. We see in Jude that they were basically suffering an eternal fire. That means he's not only destroying the ones that were alive, he was destroying the ones that were dead. Okay, so I'm just uh, leaving the cemetery of uh, Baba Dra, that is Sodom, and I'm driving about eight miles to the south to another excavated site. Uh, I did. Okay. Let's see. Hold on, just a moment. Let's see if there's a few other things I want to show you.
filled with human bone remains. Um, here's some ribs uh, found in this area. Uh, burned pottery. Uh, a total burn destruction. The uh, excavators here, or the main excavator here is Walter Rast, who excavated also at Baba Draw. And uh, he describes what they found in the excavations here at Numera. He writes, the burnt debris covering this site has appeared in almost every area excavated. Whatever the cause, it was certainly a tragedy. Obviously, the town suffered a severe fire and was forever abandoned. Now, despite Walter Rast being a secular archaeologist, his conclusion about uh, what he found in excavations at Babadra and here in Numera were these. He says this, in the author's opinion, the vicissitudes of these two early bronze three cities of Babadra and Numera may well be reflected in the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible. Case of Babadra was destroyed by fire at the same time that its cemetery was destroyed by fire. Uh, the city was never rebuilt. This city associated with Gomorrah has a burn destruction over it. The city came to a dramatic end with the fire destruction at the same time uh, that Babadra was destroyed by fire. And this city was never, ever, ever lived in again. What? All right. You can see, we're reading, you can see the skeleton over there up to the left corner, left hand upper corner. Look like he just got destroyed, like he got hit without him really realizing what was going on. All right. But uh, as you can see, that, that Sodom is different nowadays. It's spiritual. All right. According to Revelation chapter 11. All right. And basically, after it's destroyed, after that is overcome, you see how it's taken to him, his great power and his reign. And we see in the book of Peter that the second coming or the coming of Yahweh. All right, we'll be with fire. Let's see, let me go here real quick. So if you're caught up in the, any of these sins, in any sin, fornication by itself is enough, but there's abomination. These are the sins that are spiritual abominations. All right, so you wanna come up out of that. Let's see. Oops. Peter talks about the coming of Yahweh. It's going to be with fire. I'm trying to find this. Where's the boy is that? Just a moment. Yeah, here's the day. If the day of the Lord will come. Notice it doesn't say the return of the Lord will come. This second epistle, beloved, I write now unto you in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. And you may be mindful of the words which were spoken by Boar by the holy prophets and the commandments of, of, of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there should come in the last day scoffers to walk it after their own lust and saying, where's the promise of his coming? Now, what I'm teaching about Yahweh coming, not returning, is what they were talking about back then. Yeah, the coming of the day of the Lord, all right? The coming of Yahweh, the one that created everything, all right? Uh, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But this they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then, being, that then was being overflowed with water perished. All right? Now, he destroyed the world from the very beginning with water when there was a lot of wickedness going on. But the heavens which in the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. All right? And as we can see in Revelation 11, that his final battle before he gets Genoma, he before he gets caught up, before the two witnesses, the two houses of Israel are caught up and restored, is basically a spiritual Sodom in Egypt. 
Uh, Egypt means captivity and uh, oppression, but it's Sodom. And you just imagine, just look at the word, and what is it, Genesis chapter 20, 21, uh, what happened to the people then, what they tried to do to the angels, which really, they were basically trying to do that to Yahweh, to the one that sits on the throne. All right? They were trying to do that to Yahweh, the one that sits on the throne. But the beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with Yahweh is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Yahweh is not going to slack concerning his promises. Some of you ain't going to slackness. But his long suffering toward his word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of Yahweh, now I want you to look at this. But the day of Yahweh, did it say the return of Yahweh? No, it's talking about the day of Yahweh will come as a thief in the night. I'm not talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. It said the day of Yahweh will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. We saw this in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, 13, where the heavens will roll away like a scroll. All right, let me read that again. Uh, but the day of Yahweh will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent and heat. Very also and the works there, that are therein shall be burned up. And that's what they said when you study that about Sodom and Gomorrah. That there were some things that were melted with fervent heat. Now, anything that's so hot, it causes the burnt, the graves, the, the bones in the grave to, 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 to be bent, to be warped. It's hot, okay? Uh, the, works in the, the earth and the works, also in the works that are there and should be burned up. Seeing then that all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons are you to be? In all ho holy conversation and godly. Looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of God. Wherein the heavens being on fire should be dissolved, and elements should melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we of course just promise look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So, so those that are fighting spiritually with Sodom and Gomorrah, with Sodom, that, that wicked sin that's in the church. And I'm not just talking about the wicked in the world. We're talking about people that's spiritual, because it said they were spiritually called. Let me go back here. They were spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, spiritually. And I think sometimes we look at that and we just think, oh, it's talking about just the regular wicked world. The regular wicked world is not spiritual. Let me go there real quick and turn back to that page. That's even why he said that those that are caught up in those sins will not inherit the kingdom. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and, and Egypt. So it's not talking about the world. It's talking about the people in the church. That means the world has gotten into the church to get a hold to Yah's people, to get a hold to Yahweh himself. Because it's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. All right. Now, let me go to another place where we can show you can understand that there's a place now, it's a little lighter, it's, a, it's getting off this topic about the spiritual Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, we'll go to First Timothy. But that's how I got thrown into the bathtub with something spiritual. And it not only got a hold to me, it got my son, he was on a bus, a bus broke down he stabbed himself in the hand with, with something. What else happened, Drake? Uh, Stream Senator Shards. Huh? Stabbed me in the finger. Yeah, you got stabbed in the finger. The bus mm -hmm. got stopped. And, and he basically got in touch with me. He says, is, is there anything going on wrong there? Is anything happening to you? You know, basically letting me know that something spiritual, something was dynamically uh supernaturally doing something and basically i i just went through the same thing and i was amazed that he it was going on with him basically when i when yeah opened my mind up about this the devil attacked me spiritually you know and the spiritual reality of it was real it was it was in the physical world all right so that that means that this spiritual sin sodomy He's still angry about what Yah did to Sodom and Gomorrah thousands of years ago. And he this time he's coming back, he bought it back in style with a new twist. You know what I'm saying? 
I saw, what was it, Steve Harvey wearing some bell bottoms the other day. And it wasn't so bailed where you it was just out of just out of whack. Like, man, look at them bailed out. It was just a little bit kind of flared at the at the foot. You know what I'm saying? Back in the 70s, bell bottoms was all, all over the place. All right. It's coming back with a new twist. When styles they go out, and when they come back with afro and all that, they come back colorless. The same way with Sodom. When Sodom comes back, when it's come back, to be honest with you, but it's come back with a new twist. Spiritual Sodom. That means you got churches that are basically ran by people that's still struggling with this, with these sins. You got some churches that literally have the pastor and the religious leader declaring that they are voila, that they are those people. All right. But it's so it's so strong, you can tell that that's what the man of sin is going to have with him. His spirit basically is the spirit of Sodom in Egypt. All right. We'll talk some more about this, you know, maybe next week. But uh, I want to show you this. It went about controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, some people read this and say, oh, that's talking about Jesus. But remember, Jesus ain't God. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preaching to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received within the glory. So who is this talking about if Jesus ain't God? I want to show you something. It's talking about the one that's coming. It's a like prophecy. Thirty-four sixty-six is the word for mystery in the Greek. Uh, a secret or a mystery. I want to go. I want to take this to my. You still on that Drake? Yeah. Let me see, hold on just a moment. Let's see if you can see it. You got it? Yes. I want to get on here and see if I can get this word for mystery. Get an exhaustive concordance on it. So I go to my olive tree. There it is. I might have to, to highlight this one too. So if our controversy created the mystery of God. All right, let's look at this word mystery. Can you see that? Huh? Can you see? Oh yeah, I can. Can you see it? Yeah, it's just delayed. I can see it though. Okay, can you see that? Can you scrolling? Yeah. Okay. So it's 3466 in the Greek. Basically, it's a mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. I mean, let's look at this word mystery. What does it mean, the mystery of godliness? A uh, person initiated in, into mysteries, which is from Mule, Greek 3453, to initiate, learn a secret, a secret or exotoric knowledge all right and what the first meaning it denotes a general something hidden but not fully manifested second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 speaks of the mystery of iniquity which began to work in secret and was not then completely disclosed or manifested all right you know the devil is basically a counterfeiter and what he was planning on doing was counterfeiting yahweh's manifestation all right that's what the mystery of iniquity is all about. And part of his iniquity, his mystery, is sin. Basically, what we was talking about Sodom, that his major sin and his major fight against Yahweh in that day would be with spiritual Sodom. All right. Number two, the second meaning. And then believe it, that's, that spirit is, is, is a strong manifestation. Some sacred thing hidden or secret, which is naturally unknown to human reason. Is only known by revelation of God. All right, let me go. Let me make sure that I get the dual definition. Uh, only known by by revelation of God. And most of the people that I that I talk to are not aware that the coming of Yahweh is basically coming of the one that sits on the throne up in heaven to sit on the throne on earth too. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Paul, number three, Paul speaks of the mystery of, of the relationship between Christ and his church as being great. The apostle speaks in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, of a man of understanding all, all mysteries. For example, all the revealed truths of the Christian religion, which is elsewhere called the mystery of the faith. All right. In Matthew 13, 11, to them it is not given means the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are not revealed to them since they are not related to King Jesus. Mysterion denotes a, denotes a spiritual truth couched under an external representation or similitude. Now watch this. Denotes a spiritual truth couched under an external representation or similitude and concealed or hidden thereby unless some explanation is given. All right. Uh, number four, and their in their respect, the respective context, in their respective context, that's the last part of that number, number three means. Number four, in the writing of Paul, the word mysterion is sometimes applied in a particular sense to the calling of the Gentile. In, in Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 6, the fact that the Gentiles could be fellow heirs at the same body, partakers of Christ by the gospel, is called the mystery and the mystery of Christ. In other, in other generations, such a, such a thing was not made known to the sons of men, and as it had been revealed to his apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Okay. Let's see. But the real thing that I was trying to get to, I will I read right over is, is number two meaning. From sacred thing hidden, a secret which is naturally unknown to human reason, is only known by revelation of God. So the only way you can know that Yahweh himself was coming, and he's kept his secret. Yahweh himself, instead of just Jesus, is by the revelation of God. So when I got filled with the Spirit, that was a revelation of God when he showed me the man standing in the doorway. And, what, and here's what I saw. I saw a person that seemed to be just like anybody else. But some type of way, he was still alive, even though he had went through what seemed to be a death. I didn't see that he had died. I thought that he was still around, his ghost was still around after he had died. I didn't see that he had died, but I saw his ghost was still hanging around after he had died. All right. And what I saw was what was, was some people call uh, chariots or, or spaceships, but it wasn't a chariot or spaceship. It was a world. That's what I saw. It was a world that was so dangerous for the wicked. It would cut them into pieces if they went into it. So when I read that Zion is coming, like in Second, uh, second Ezra chapter 13, the Zion that the man formed in the air, the mountain that he formed in the air, that's what it looked like. And as a matter of fact, the man that seemed to be flying around the place in that chapter of second Ezra chapter 13 looked like the man that was standing in the doorway. All right. He was not in his 30s, he was in his 50s. He was an older man. In the fact, he was older than his body. For some reason, I saw his mind and stuff was older. His real age was old, but his body was still young, even though he was in his 50s. All right? So by revelation, Yah showed this to me. All right? He didn't show me Jesus. I thought that I should have saw Jesus. But I saw the man is coming. All right? I saw the man is coming. Remember, the first man, Adam, was made, a living, was made a living soul. The second man, a quickening spirit. That word quickening means that he, they, he, he basically is the one that raises people from the dead to eternal life. Not just raises them from the dead. Because we see Jesus, Yahweh Shai raising people from the dead, Lazarus. He stopped and he raised, raised a widow woman's son up. They was carrying him to his gravesite on a briar. Touched the briar and raised the man up. We see a few things like that with Yahweh Shai, but they died again. But this one is coming. It's the one that raises people up from the dead to stay alive forever. All right, so that's, that's where he's a quickening spirit in First Corinthians chapter 15. That one is not Yahweh Shai, he's the Yahweh, the one that's going to be on earth as Yahweh. Let's read that again. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, 
Notice he's justified in the spirit. Justified in the spirit. He's not justified in the flesh. He's manifest in the flesh, but justified in the spirit. And that's what I saw. You know, and when I saw it, I didn't know who that man was. And I finally come to the conclusion because I was 19, 20 years old. I was very young in my faith and in the, in the, in the knowledge of the word. I, was, and I didn't know we were Hebrew Israelites in 1984. Who did? Except a few people in, in, in New York. They knew we were Hebrew Israelites, but not everybody like it is today. So when I saw him, I reasoned quickly who that could be. When, I, when, when the thought came into my head that that could be the devil, I turned my head from him. All right, but really, he didn't do anything to me, he didn't hurt me. And now what I've learned over the years that that had to have been the one, all right? And he was so human that when I, I, the thought came into my head, he could be the devil. But that's the one that was standing on the sapphire stone in Exodus chapter 24. So he was wearing what looked to be some Jewish some Orthodox clothes, Jewish Orthodox with a black suit jacket and black suit pants. He was wearing that with his collar turned up like he was like he was like as if he was swagging a little bit. All right. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, priest unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. So this God is coming, and this is basically basically this is a prophecy. The Yahweh's life was a prophecy of that Yahweh was his lamb. Yahweh was his lamb. All right. So let me go back here. I had a few things I wanted to show. And some people would go to the scripture in Hebrews and say that the scripture in Hebrew was, was taken from the, uh, from the uh, what is it, Septuagint, all right, about Yahweh uh, in Psalm 45. But uh, Hebrews chapter one has the same scriptures. It's quoting from Psalm 45, all right? And, it's, and it says that, let me go to the beginning of this chapter so you can see what it's talking about. I want to explain it. Some people would say, no, I don't believe that because Hebrews chapter one says this. I don't want to try to explain this real quick. Excuse me. God who has sundry times and in diverse manners spoken time and past by the Father, took him to the fathers, by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And he ever appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the world who being the brightness of his glory and his press image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged thy sin, set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, right here it says he's being the brightness of his glory. The point is this, is that Yahweh basically is the father, all right? But at the same time, in order to come down on the earth, he's gonna have to be the son. So basically, the reason why I saw in the vision, I told you a little earlier in the video, the reason why I believe I saw Yahweh looking like exactly like me, he's showing me and revealing it to me, what he had been showing me all along, that, uh, that he would have to be the same person almost as the son of God, the son of Yah, that really is Yah, to be his, be his lamb. So if he is the lamb, that means uh, the burnt offering for Yahweh, just like the just like Isaac was going to be the burnt offering for Abraham, yet this this person Jesus Christ would be the burnt offering for Yahweh, his father. So that person is, that's that he's going to be a burnt offering for it will be in the earth in the latter days. All right, I hope you understand it. He'd be in the earth in the latter days. All right. But he would look, if he was to go back, let me put it this way, if he was to go back in time on a time machine and see Yahweh Shai, and you come to come to the come forward and you see that person, he would look just like him. He would, he, he would look just like him. So he was sacrificing for that person who really is the father, but would be in a position as his son. 
So sometimes when you read the scriptures and it's talking about the son of God, sometimes you have to look and say, what about the son that's coming? That he was the lamb that, you, that Christ was the lamb for. You have to look at it like that. Who be in the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. See that? The express image of his person. That means that what Yahweh showed me in that dream was correct. That the one that Yahweh would be sacrificing for, which would be for the whole world, but especially for the Father, where he would look just like him. He'd be just like him. He'd have all the stuff that's just like the Father, and what he's going to be in the earth in a lot of days when he comes down in glory. The express image of his person. See that? And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged thy sin, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So why is he sitting on the right hand of the majesty on high? He was sitting to the latter days when Yahweh would come. That's why Yahweh said, sit down on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So he would come down into the earth and, and battle, basically. Hold on just a moment. Being made so much better than the angels as he had by, by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels has he at any time, as he said at any time, thou art my son, this day have thou begotten me. And again, I will be to him a father, he should be, be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he says, and let the, all the angels of God worship him. And of the, of the angels, he said, who make his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now remember too, in Second, second Thessalonians chapter one, it says that Yahweh and the, and the mighty angels of heaven are gonna be manifested as flame and fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God, and that do not keep his commandments, all right? So when, when Yahweh comes, when he's glorified, he comes as the ancient of days. He has all that fire around him that, that it's saying that Yahweh Shai and the angels will be manifested as that fire that he has around him. All right. And this is for the second coming of Yahweh Shai. So we see Yahweh Shai coming after the, after, the, after the ancient of days takes vengeance. All right. But he's going to be taking vengeance with Yahweh Shai and, and manifested as flames of fire. Him and the angels. And of the angels, he says, who make his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. All right, let's see. But unto the Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So you, that's why you got to read it like that. If you know that the Son, that Yahweh, is going to manifest in the earth, then he would have to be in a position of a son while he is really the Father and the Son. Now, this is where the Trinity almost sounds correct. But the Trinity says that God is three, pers three, three persons. Three in one. How can I put it? That God, or they three different persons. But what I got out of this is that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is the same thing. They're the same person. It's just that he's over here, he's, a, he's over here sitting on the throne in heaven. He's over here sitting on the throne on the earth. He's called the Son on the earth sitting over here, but he's called the Father in heaven sitting on the throne up in heaven. But we all know that he's really Yahweh as the son. I hope I'm not confusing anybody. But unto the son, he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellow. And remember in Revelation 21, he said, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. Who would inherit all things? And I will be his God and he should be my son. Who will inherit all things? And some people will overlook over that and just say, all of us inherit all things. No, not everybody's going to inherit all things. Somebody's inheriting all things. You, oh, that's Jesus. No, it's not talking about Jesus because remember, Jesus is already in heaven. It's talking about he that overcome him. Future, he that overcome him. But unto the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever scepter of righteousness, and scepter of thy kingdom, as love righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, scroll up, and thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hand. But basically, it's telling you that this person that he's calling Lord right here is, and he's calling him the Son of God, he is Yahweh himself. But Yahweh Shai is not Yahweh himself. He's the Lamb of Yah. He's the Lamb of Yah. So when you look at these scriptures and you see them talking, you have to also remember these things. 
thou Lord in the beginning was laid the foundation. Now we know that Yahweh in John chapter one says that all things were created with, through him, through the, through the one that basically would come is called Jesus Christ. That Yah basically created him in the beginning and he put him on like a garment and created everything else with him on. That's how Yah created everything. He put Yahweh Shai on before he became known as Yahweh Shai. Put him on and created everything, the heavens and the earth. And thou, Yahweh, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hand. They shall perish with thy remains. They shall wax, all shall wax old as those of garment. And as a vesture shalt thou, let's see, hold on just a moment. Shalt thou fold them up and they shall be changed, but thou art the same and thy years shall not fail. So I wanted to explain that. That's how you got to read the scriptures because in the, in the New Testament, it's kind of, it's, a, it's more of a mystery to me in the New Testament than it is in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you see, Yahweh is going, God is going up with a shout. Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. God is the king of all the earth. Yahweh is the king of all the earth. You see that just plain there. But in the New Testament, it basically has some mysteries going on. Great is the mystery of godliness. And basically, you have to have some revelation to really figure that thing out. Is Yahweh Shai God? Or is he just the Lamb of God? You know, you have to have some, you have to have some revelation to figure it out. But let me let you go. I think I've been on here long enough. I believe I've been on here long enough. But uh, it's, really a, it's really a heck of a thing that Yahweh would do that. But his really his major purpose to bring an Israel out of Egypt so that he might dwell among them. I don't think he's just dwelling among them just in the spiritual, spiritual sense. He's dwelling literally among them. Exodus chapter 29. Let me see if I can go there real quick before I let you go. So he's going to basically dwell in, in Revelation chapter 7. It says that he just, the one that sits on the throne shall dwell among the people. So let's go to Exodus. Exodus 29. You see in Exodus 24, he came down, he was on a, his feet was on a sapphire stone and he, they was eating and drinking and they saw the God of Israel and he laid down his hands on them, right? We see that. But look at Exodus 29, it tells you why he delivered Israel out of Egypt. You know, Revelation chapter 11 says they, they, they dwell, they lay, their bodies lay dead in the streets of the city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Okay. Let's see. And Exodus 29, 45, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am Yahweh, the Allah And that I, that and that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them. I am Yahweh the Allah. That word dwell basically really means that to tabernacle. Just like Revelation 7 says, he will dwell with the one that sits on the throne, but dwell among the people. Let's see, hold on just a moment. 7931 in the Hebrew. Shakan is the word for dwell. Uh, the idea of lodging. Let me highlight that real quick. Lodging. You don't spiritually lodge around somebody. But if you look like that devil that threw me in the bathtub the other day, you just won't be able to see somebody. But he, he doing some wicked stuff. No, that's not what Yahweh would do because he showed up to the children of Israel when the covenant confirmed meal was being eaten. He showed up with a sapphire stone underneath his feet. And he didn't lay his hands on the children of Israel. They saw God and ate and drank. The idea of lodging, to reside or permanently stay. Look at that, let me highlight this. So this is the reason why it's good to notice and then Yah has called me to teach this. I know a lot of Hebrews like they got their own gift what well, Yah is giving them to teach, but he's given me this to teach, to reside or permanently stay. So Yah wants to, to reside or permanently stay with his people that he brought out of Egypt, that he's gonna bring out of Egypt in the latter day. He couldn't do it in the beginning because they basically was unfaithful. They was unfaithful bride. But the new covenant has him residing and permanently staying with his people to abide, 
to continue, cause to be made to, to dwell, a dweller, have habitation, inhabit, lay place, cause to remain, rest, set up. See that? So there he is. That's the one that's coming. So whenever you see something saying different, you have to basically take notice of it and see where, where basically the misunderstanding is at. All right. That Yahweh himself is coming down and he's coming down and live in the human flesh. That means he will have a surgeon. He will be in flesh. That means he will have tests, trials, temptation. He might even have sin or what is it called iniquity. All right. Because the Bible says that, that he becomes one of us, the man that Adam, that becomes one of the people in heaven to know good and evil. All right. And that Yah would have a lamb. He would have a burnt offering. All right. Let's go to this last one. We're going to shut this down. So this should make you kind of, if you, you love Yahweh, this should make you happy. That Yah is going to know everybody. He's going to know all his people. That's why there won't be no more preaching and teaching, saying, know the Lord. We're going to all know him from the least unto the greatest. So let's go to Revelation chapter 7. That means he's going to be, he's going to be one of the dwellers among the people. All right. Like he said, you should know that I'm Yahweh, Yahweh, I am, and where we just come from. All right. There's 144,000 of Israel sealed. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robe? Whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, that washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. All right. Now remember, the ancient of days has on a has on a garment that's what white as snow, in, in Daniel chapter seven. So that means that he had to been the one that the lamb was really that was the burnt offering for. White as snow. Now these people right here have have robes that have been made white in the blood of the lamb, but in Daniel chapter seven verse nine it says his robe was white as snow. The ancient of days robe was white as snow. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. He that sit upon the throne shall dwell among the people, dwell among them. Let me highlight this whole thing. That whole chat, the whole scripture right there, Revelation 7, 15. He that sits on the throne will what? Dwell among them. And I guarantee you when you see him, you see the lamb, they probably look just alike, except one would be older and one would be young. Therefore, are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. So if you want to find out somebody sitting on the throne, who? Go to Revelation chapter 4. <clears throat> it talks about the one sitting on the throne. Yahweh himself, the ancient of days, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore, neither shall the sun light on them anymore, or, or, nor any heat. For the land which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of the waters, and God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes. All right? God's going to make it all make sense. The lamb's going to feed them. It's in the midst of the throne. shall feed them and lead them to living fountains of waters. So I'm not trying to take the, the Yahweh's glory from him. That's not my point. That's not my point on this. I'm trying to get you to see that the one that's coming is Yahweh. The coming of Yahweh. Not the return of Yahweh. The coming of Yahweh. But Yahweh is... Basically, <laughs> you, like I just said, when you see him, you're going to see a younger looking Yahweh. You're going to see that he was the lamb of Yahweh. He was the burnt offering. And he does, you know, like they did in Revelation chapter 5, they gave him glory, they worshiped him, they bowed down, sang songs to him. 
for what he did because he done something that basically none of us could do. He done something none of us could do. Hallelujah. But anyway, let me let you go. I would like to ask if there's anybody that's on the, on the screen with me right now. If anybody's still on, if they have any questions. If they have any questions, you can hurry up and ask. If not, we're going to end this Bible study. All right, shalom, everybody. And see you next week. We we got new moon coming up here on Saturday. All right, so this is the last Shabbat, the 29th of the second month. New moon on Saturday, and we're on the third month. And that's probably around the time that Israel wound up at Sinai, and they came out of Egypt thousands of years ago. All right, shalom.